everybody. Uh, welcome to meeting number four of the Single Use Products Working Group. And we have a busy, uh, an ambitious agenda for today. Um, we have a little wiggle room because we have um, one person is sick, so uh, we're going to have one less witness than anticipated. That said, we have a brisk schedule, and so I'll ask people to, uh, although it's we have limited time for everyone, I think when people move right along, we, we usually hear everything we need to hear, and we can always ask follow-up questions. So with apologies for the tight schedule, uh, let's get started. And are you Mr. Button? I am. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Todd Bowden. I'm the general manager of Farrell Distributing Corporation, uh, representing the Vermont Wholesale Beverage Association. Uh, whose members include a number of Vermont beer wine wholesalers. Vermont beer wine wholesalers are family-owned local companies employing thousands of Vermonters. Our companies have significant capital investments in Vermont, including large warehouses, fleets of trucks that deliver a wide variety of beer and wine brands to over 1,200 licensed uh, bars, restaurants, and stores across the state. We are not a multinational out-of-state company as we are sometimes portrayed. We have been operating the bottle deposit system in Vermont for nearly 45 years and are responsible stewards of our products and the environment. At the onset, I want to be clear that Vermont beer and wine distributors are not here to just say no. We are open to discussing alternatives to the bottle bill for those products that we sell that are not already covered, such as wine bottles. Alternatives should apply to all glass, not just beverages. A&R has been hosting a series of Bottleville stakeholder meetings and there is near unanimous agreement by the stakeholders that operate the Bottleville that there are serious problems including the number of sorts retailers are required to perform. Space constraints are also a problem for redemption centers. Fraud in the system is, and ensuring non-traditional entrants to the market comply with current regulations. Vermont must address the following serious operational flaws of the existing bottle bill before making any changes such as expansion to new product types. I would like to address two issues that go largely unnoticed by the public and the legislative community in regard to the bottle bill. One that has been around a long time and the other is a relatively new problem that will increase exponentially over time. First, the issue that has been around the longest is fraud. Deposits require a costly system of oversight and auditing retailers and redemption centers to ensure that not only deposit containers purchased in Vermont are being redeemed and to root out fraud in the system. In my 30 years, I have witnessed countless cases of fraud in the system. Recently, one of my employees visiting a redemption center near the New Hampshire border captured on film a large truck and trailer loaded with bags of empties. You have uh, pictures in your packet to this effect. This vehicle with New Hampshire plates left the empties without being paid, and the empties were in standard redemption center bags that the distributors pay for and supply. This was reported to A&R, and A&R did act on this. This suggests the way it was carried out that it was an organized effort. A few years ago, the, the, uh, sorry, the Vermont Co-Mingling Group paid to investigate a situation in Brattleboro where a U-Haul truck with neatly wrapped pallets of empties were being returned on a regular basis. This is large-scale fraud, but the greatest cost comes in the form of everyday returns that are fraudulent, people returning bottles they never paid the deposit on. Increasing the scope of the bottle bill while the current system cannot protect Vermont businesses already negatively impacted by the bottle bill's regulatory shortcomings is unjust. I'd just like to pause a minute to, I didn't include the pictures, but here's a, here's a picture of pallets of blue bins from Cheshire in New Hampshire, the town of Cheshire, that was coming over to Vermont on a regular basis. So they're actively sorting and bringing them over. And then palletized product as well. So this is fairly large scale. Second, the newer issue, but one that will grow exponentially, there are many non-traditional entrants into Vermont's retail beverage marketplace, including hundreds of out-of-state wineries and internet retailers that ship wine to Vermonters. The same is true for other non-carbonated beverages. As a result, it would be extremely difficult to enforce any requirement that these non-traditional entrants into Vermont's market include 
on their labels the Vermont deposit insignia, or initiate the deposit when they sell the wine, pick up the empty wine bottles from Vermont's 1,200 retailers, and pay refunds and handling fees in Vermont. Local Vermont wine distributors will be left paying these expenses while out-of-state businesses enjoy the ill-gotten profits. There are already more glass containers redeemed through the redemption system than are sold by Vermont registered deposit initiators in Vermont's commingling system. I'd like to just repeat that because it's the most important point to make in this whole uh, testimony. There are already more glass containers redeemed through the redemption system than are sold by Vermont registered deposit initiators in Vermont's commingling system. This demonstrates that Vermont is already experiencing fraudulent redemption as glass beverage bottles are purchased out of state and make their way to Vermont. There are other reasons that make expanding the current bottle bill system less advantageous than tackling recycling for single-use products as a whole. Vermont's bottle deposit system is inefficient and costly because the same containers must be counted numerous times so consumers and retailers are reimbursed for their deposits and handling fees. Each touch of the container adds cost to the system. Imposing a deposit and a three and a half cent handling fee on each wine bottle will increase the price of the wine to the Vermont consumer and make the product more attractive to purchase either online or in a neighboring state. The Agency of Natural Resources commissioned a report by DSM Environmental Services titled Systems Analysis of the Impact of Act 148 on Solid Waste Management in Vermont. That was dated October 21, 2013. That report found that in 2013, the existing bottle bill cost all parties, including distributors, consumers, redemption centers, and the state, over $11 million to operate per year. This is an extremely costly system to our, sorry, costly system to operate. We believe the state should consider alternatives that would better use our resources to focus on all products rather than just beverage containers. And in doing so, we'll get a better environmental bang for the buck. The 2018 Waste Composition Report provides data about 8,000 tons of glass, which makes up 1.9% of the total 422,000 tons of all mixed municipal solid waste, including both residential, commercial, and industrial, disposed in Vermont in one year. The data from this report also demonstrates that glass from wine bottles and other non-carbonated glass beverage bottles comprise less than half of the glass disposed of at Vermont's MRFs. Even if Vermont had an expanded bottle bill, MRFs would still have to process 3,300 tons of glass from other products and sources. You have heard at your meeting from, the rep from a representative at Chittenden Solid Waste District that they are in the process of upgrading the technology at the MRF in Wilson. Given that imposing a bottle bill on wine will still leave a significant amount of glass to be processed through the MRFs, a more comprehensive solution that will address all glass and not just beverage container glass is needed. Per the data from the 2018 Waste Composition Study, expanded bottle bill glass, which includes wine bottles and non-carbonated glass beverages such as juice, accounts for 0.6% of municipal solid waste by weight in Vermont. Recovery rates for non-deposit glass are already very high in Vermont, so there'd be little environmental benefit and there's no need to impose a deposit to get the glass back. Imposing deposits on wine bottles will also lead to a greater carbon footprint due to increased transportation that exists within that system. Wine bottles currently go from table to blue bin, where they are transported to a MRF. Deposits would require extra transportation by the consumer to the retailer and then again for the wholesaler to pick it up at the retailers. Glass is heavy and very expensive to transport. <clears throat> Imposing a deposit and a handling fee on wine will cause wine sales to decrease in retail stores along all of Vermont's borders, thereby reducing tax revenue generated by wine sales in Vermont. New York and Massachusetts do not impose a bottle deposit on wine, New Hampshire does not have a bottle bill and imposes no sales tax on wine or beer, giving that state an even greater edge. Increasing the bottle deposit from five to 10 cents on all beverages subject to the bottle bill would significantly increase the price for monitors to pay for beer and soda at the cash register, a total of $2.40 per case just for deposits. 
This would send more Vermonters along the border to New Hampshire without a bottle bill and New York and Massachusetts with a five cent deposit. Once they purchase products in a bordering state, they often return those empty beverage containers in Vermont and get reimbursed for deposits they didn't pay. Buying a case of beer in New Hampshire would come along with the added bonus of being able to return the empties in Vermont and get $2.40. This sets in motion a scenario whereby Vermont businesses lose sales, the state loses tax revenues, and distributors pay for containers they never sold. This is not good business or governance. Why beer and not wine? I've heard this question came up at your last meeting. And historically, the bottle bill was enacted as a litter control measure in the 1970s. Wine bottles were not a large part of Vermont's litter problem then, and they, and they certainly are not now. I hope my testimony today about fraud and all the non-traditional entrants to the wine market in Vermont helped you better understand the current challenges with imposing a bottle bill on, on wine bottles. We already have over-redemption in glass in the Vermont commingling program. Some recommendations. We recommend the ANR bottle bill stakeholder group, or ANR bottle bill stakeholder group, is considering asking for legislation to require more manufacturers to commingle to ensure they are participating in the system and to reduce the number of sorts of retailers. Please consider this and other ways to address the significant operational issues with the existing bottle bill before changes are proposed to bring additional containers into the system. BWBA members would welcome the opportunity to work with the state and other stakeholders on alternatives to the bottle bill that will address not just beverage containers, but all products. We believe a more comprehensive solution will increase recycle rates, generate funds for necessary investments in technology at our solid waste facilities, have a greater environmental benefit, be good for the Vermont economy, and be less costly for Vermonters. We urge you to direct interested stakeholders to work out the details of this proposal. Initiators of bottle deposits must begin remitting unclaimed deposits to the state with the first quarterly payment due this January 2020. These funds are currently earmarked for water quality. As this is revenue that is generated by the bottle deposit law, we urge you to propose that a part or all of the unclaimed deposits be redirected to build up Vermont's recycling infrastructure and address other needs in Vermont's solid waste system to increase recycling rates in Vermont. Let me finish by saying that the BWBA members that I represent fully understand and embrace our responsibility in improving the current system of material recovery and processing. Thank you for considering my testimony. I'm open to questions. Thank you. Um, on recommendation number three, that was actually part of the recommended recommendation of the committee two fellow legislators, but uh, by the time the bill came out, mm -hmm. uh, that money had been kept in an environmental effort, but shifted to the uh, water, uh, just by way of explanations. Um, any uh, questions from the committee for Mr. Butler? Yes, please. Uh, can you explain um, what it would mean logistically to put five cents on a wine bottle, as far as the distributor is concerned? Sure. Uh, Currently, and I can speak a little bit more specific about our business, uh, we, we handle roughly uh, five to six million bottles of wine a year. And we're a, what we call a bottle state, meaning we sell each bottle of wine individually. You don't have to order by the case. That product comes into our warehouse. We would then have to hire a crew of people to open five to six million bottles of wine, pull it, sticker it drop it back in the box. I saw this practice in place in Maine a number of years ago when I went up to, to visit with Pine State. And they had a crew of, I believe, seven people doing it at, at the time. One concern with that right now is quite honestly, we, we have not had a full staff for our operational part of the business for well over three years at any one point in time. We usually, we average about five to six empty positions every day right now. So I don't think staffing that is going to be easy at all. Plus, the job itself is you know, <laughs> completely tedious. Um, there will be no 
middle to small suppliers in the wine industry that will have any interest in helping us with that or changing their labeling. So we'll end up having to do it. Uh, you might get a couple of the large suppliers to do that, like a Gallo or something like that, but it, uh, you know, it, it, in one way, shape, or form, it's going to be just a tremendous uh, undertaking of labor. You know, I heard, um, I read through some of the notes from the previous meetings. I think there was a figure out there that suggested there is 18 million bottles of wine in, in Vermont. I don't, I don't really understand where that number would come from because we. We know what our market share is, and we know what we do. And I think a more realistic number for Vermont is going to be between 10 and a half and 12 million bottles a year. Um, but I'm sure you all know people. I certainly know people, including my wife, that loves to stop in New Hampshire on the way up through and buy a case of wine because it's a great deal. Uh, and I just think we're going to we're going to exasperate the problem with our own small businesses in the state. The other thing that's really important is when we first ha started having these discussions about the bottle bill with Kathy's group, it became apparent that a lot of people don't understand the extent at which containers come into the state of Vermont differently now than they ever did. You know, when I first started 30 years ago, there was maybe five wholesalers. That was it. And you controlled 95 to 99% of the containers. Now, you got everything from small craft beverage manufacturers who don't quite understand the law and their, their bottles and cans come into mix. We have third party distribution centers out of state that sell to the likes of a Dollar General and they don't really know what those laws are but those come into the state. Uh, there's online sales for beer clubs, wine clubs. I know recently the, the gentleman from Coca-Cola uh, he gave it a, a data point in New Hampshire where they shipped four to five pallets a week to an Amazon distribution center. So I think that it's foolish to think that that's going to slow down. I think it's going to increase. I mean, we certainly, in running our business, fully expect that our piece of the pie is going to continue to get smaller. We sure don't want to be saddled with any expenses associated with that business that weren't born from us. Any other questions? Yeah, quick question. So, um, um, Spears in Vermont, yeah. are they all stickered by the state? Yes. By their system? Yeah, stickered by the state. Um, I, I, that's my belief. I don't think that has changed. Uh, I, I do know that they have difficulty with maintaining the stickers. We actually did a, uh, uh, we did our own little survey recently and found that, I don't know what the percentage is, but there's a fair percentage that those stickers do not last all the way through the system. Are there other states um, with that deposit on um, wine bottles that you're aware of? And, and are those jurisdictions, is it working any better someplace else? Maine is, is the one I'd be most familiar with. Um, they have a very different co-mingling system up there and their entire system is built uh, differently than Vermont. So I can't really speak to the the specific efficiencies that they're experiencing. I do, however, know that the stickering of the bottles is, uh, is just a, <laughs> it's a huge problem for them. Uh, in fact, for a while, they just stopped doing it because they couldn't staff it. Um, and just, I want to make sure I understand the logistics. Um, so, w w wine, if there were, if wine bottles in Vermont were sticker, you were talking about, well, People traveling through New Hampshire might want to pick up a case, and, okay. but I, what I'm missing is how would they be redeemable in Vermont? Sure. So we've learned from um, the the explosion of the craft brew industry, right? For example, that it really doesn't matter what's on the bottle. Uh, we audit the wholesalers run the Vermont co-mingling system, and we pay to have a gentleman that audits that system, and he goes out to the redemption centers and does his best to try to, you know, to, to quell that problem. But at the end of the day, you're still working with, you know, probably a high school kid in the back of a beverage redemption center who is just throwing them in, and uh, you're not catching it all. Now, in our meetings with A&R, we discuss a lot about the technology that is out there and available to try to fix that, but that technology is extremely expensive, and you only see it really deployed in, in massive systems. I mean, at the end of the day, Vermont is still only a 600,000 resident state. Right. Okay. So, to answer your question, I, 
I don't think the sticker is the end all. I mean, yeah. sure, you know, you can still try to stop it, but it, invariably much of it is going to go into a bin. Okay. Any other questions from the committee? No. Can you tell us the process of, you were talking about the environmental footprint of bringing it to point A and to point B, yeah. but when you pick up your bottles that you distribute, will you tell me the process? Sure. So um, I'll give you an answer of, of the way it used to be and kind of the way we do it today. So back when I first started, we didn't have commingling or third-party collection systems. So we as the wholesaler collected every single account in the state of Vermont all of their empties. Uh, those would be brought back to our facilities. We processed them and ultimately back then we also marketed that material to recycling companies or companies that would use the material. Very labor intensive, a lot of travel. Um, lots of redemption centers and small stores were much more engaged in the redemption process back then. As years went on, we developed a co-mingling system and part of that was because the the number of items had started to grow so quickly that we, we just needed a new way of getting everything into one box because the redemption centers couldn't handle the sorts. So we developed what was called the commingling system whereby a group of distributors, not all, but a group, participate in this. It's all in, all of our material goes into that. Um, that's picked up by a third party company called Tamra. So they're out picking that up from redemption centers. The wholesalers still go out and pick up the small stores and on-premise accounts, okay? So you have two parallel systems. You have Tomer picking up the, the, the bulk of it at the large redemption centers, and you have the independent wholesalers still picking it up at all the little mom and pop groceries and all of the on-premise accounts. Those products come back to our warehouse, they get handled, cross-docked, and then Tomer comes in and picks it up from us and then trucks it out of state. So you, you really have multiple things going on with many trucks on the road, more than you used to have. It's From a carbon footprint standpoint, it's, it's not very advantageous. As opposed to consumer finishes the product, puts it in a recycle bin, it's picked up once and it goes right to a, collect, or a facility for processing. So it's much more streamlined that way. Great. Thank you very much for your uh, testimony. Thank you. Alan Hi, Alan. This is Mike Front from the Single Use Products Working Group. Hey, Mike. How are you? Good. Hi, Mike. Uh, this is the Committee Chair, Chris Bray, and we're, you're uh, on speaker phone in a room with 50 or 60 people. And uh, we have your um, uh, your PowerPoint up on the screen, and uh, the floor is yours. Just want to note that um, for the context of my testimony, we're an organization that's been around 25 years now. We started in 1994. Uh, during that time, we've recycled 20 billion containers, weighing over 1.6 million metric tons. Um, so uh, we, we've been at this a long time. Um, in terms of my presentation overview, next slide. I just want to talk about EPR in BC, uh, touch on EPR for packaging in BC and, and how it works, uh, a bit of an overview of the onboard system, and then talk about some of the benefits of the MP, of EPR as well as the impact on municipalities. And then just uh, briefly touch on a couple of things that we have coming up in terms of changing our model. Next slide. So in terms of extended producer responsibility, um, you know, I have to get this question, what does that mean? You know, what they extended to what? So and really when we talked about extended producer responsibility, it's, it's, discussed, it's making producers responsible for the end of life management of their products and packaging. Um, and in terms of what does that mean in responsibility, it means that producers under an EPR system producers are responsible uh, for collecting, recycling, and diverting material from landfill. And as part of that, paying the costs associated with that could be set out in a storage plan, which in the case of BC is ultimately approved by the BC Ministry of Environment. In terms of whose responsibility, it's really the producer. So in BC's model, the actual um, legal obligation is on those producers who either um, are manufacturers of the product um, in BC or who um, import uh, the product into BC. Um, now they can uh, uh, implement uh, a program through a third party agency like Encore to ensure that they meet the obligations under the regulation, uh, but if they don't belong to an organization like ours, then ultimately they need to do something on their own 
to meet their obligations under the recycling regulation. And just to note here, producer is sometimes known as a steward in other provinces. I typically refer to them as producers. And, and really, producer in the BC definition is you know, brand owner, so someone that's a manufacturer resident in BC. Um, and if there is no manufacturer resident in BC for the product, then that ultimately falls to the retailer or distributor that imports that product into the province. In terms of our, our law, um, BC is somewhat unique. Uh, so we have an environmental management act um, that we enacted in 2004. That's not unique. Uh, what is unique is that uh, in the same year we filed uh, the recycling regulation. So this is an umbrella uh, regulation under which all the separate programs are governed. And what it means is um, the legislature doesn't need to introduce a new uh, regulation each time that they include different programs. So instead, when a new program is brought into um, effect, it's done through the addition of a schedule, which contains information that's specific to that product category. But otherwise, all the obligations are similar, uh, are the same for all the pro different product categories as uh, articulated in the overall framework for recycling regulation. So beverage container is Schedule 1. Uh, packaging and printed paper would be Schedule 5. And we now have over 15 uh, stewardship agencies in BC that manage materials such as paint, tires, and electronics. There are some smaller agencies and individual one-offs, uh, so company-specific EPR programs, but those are becoming less and less of uh, uh, something we see, and more and more um, organizations and industry are working through collective organizations, such as Encore, Return It, to um, administer their um, obligations under the recycling regulation. Next slide. Um, I have just a quick question. Um, sure. It's, uh, do you have, uh, do adjourning, uh, adjoining jurisdictions have comparable laws, or do you have any issues with um, cross border? Uh, for instance, in, in a jurisdiction that doesn't have that kind of obligation on stewardship, and yet their product is flowing into um, your province. Yeah, that's a good, uh, for the most part, um, under those 15 stewardship agencies, the neighboring jurisdictions, at least in Canada, not so much Washington State, but in Canada have uh, similar programs. There are slight deviations, so if I looked at our deposit program, we have differences in the deposit rates. And so, for example, um, you know, my aluminum cans right now only have a five cent deposit, whereas that's a 10 cent deposit in Alberta, the neighboring province. So I'm very sure that there is some movement of material from my province to Alberta uh, to gain that um, extra five cents. I don't know that it's significant, um, but I'm conscious that there is some leakage for sure. In terms of packaging EPR and BC, I think it's important to remember that we've got two programs. So our program, um, Packaging EPR BC on Core Pacific, um, we've achieved a 74% recovery rate in the last year. And that's for beverage containers in both the residential and the ICNI system. So for the beverage container schedule, we don't differentiate from where the product or where the product is sold. Every beverage container that's sold in the BC must be part of our program, and we must recover every one of those containers. And I think that's pretty consistent for deposit programs across the country. Uh, the other program is Recycle BC, and, and part of the reason I to do this presentation, so before my current role as President and CEO of Encore, I actually was the Managing Director of Recycle BC for five years. Now, Recycle BC is the first program in North America where the industry has actually taken over responsibility for um, basically your household printed paper and packaging. And so that's Schedule 5 last year, Recycle BC has a 78% recovery rate. Um, it's been over 75% each of the years it's operated. And that's for packaging and paper products, but it's only in the residential sector. And I just wanted to note that as, for anyone that's thinking of how this, this works, the ICNI system is still actually run much like it is in any other jurisdiction. And I think one of the challenges going forward is the commercial system in large population uh, centers like Vancouver, which has, you know, Metro Vancouver area has a population of roughly 2.5 million people still works relatively well. It is a challenge in some of the more rural places uh, in trying to manage that commercial outside on the EPR system where you're suddenly having to manage a smaller amount of material. So that's something to consider as well. Next slide. Hey, Alan, I'm Andy Hackman here. Just a question for both of the rates on the previous slide. Are recovery rates, are those recycling rates or just diversion rates? Um, that's a good question. So uh, I'll give a, there's a bit of a different answer for both. So the typical um, recovery rate in BC, and keep in mind, this is one of the differences in the EPR program. All the producers need to supply information about how much packaging they supply into the product. So in the Encore case for beverage containers, that's how many units of beverage containers, and that's, they have to not only tell us how many, but what different types of beverage containers are coming into the province. 
for recycle BC is how much material is coming into the um, how much material is sold into the to the marketplace. So it isn't on a unit basis, but more on a weight basis. I would note a couple things on the Encore. Um, our all of our material um, goes to recycling. Um, so when I talk about 77.4, that's on a unit basis. So we we diverted 77.4% of the containers sold in the province directly to recycling. For Recycle BC, that's how much material they collected. I would note that a certain portion of that material would end up being um, residue or waste. So I think in a typical year, about 6% of that 78% of the tonnage would end up being um, residue or material that end up going to landfill. And that could be because, not, not because of anything Recycle BC did, but because you know when they collected that container of material from the, the resident, Maybe a certain portion was, you know, garbage that was put in there by mistake. Is there waste energy in the province for Recycle BC? There is waste energy. Um, the only material that Recycle BC, so Recycle BC doesn't use waste energy in the terms of putting material to the um, waste energy facility, um, but it does. It is allowed under the recycling regulation to divert um, re packaging material that can't be recycled can be turned into um, energy pellets that can then be used in um, uh, you know, some sort of industrial enterprise like a cement kiln. Um, but there is, the, I, I should say, there's limited waste energy capacity in the province. There's only one incinerator um, based in Metro Vancouver. Does that help? Thank you, yes. All right. Um, in terms of Encore Pacific, uh, so we're an industry-owned, not-for-profit product stewardship agency, and that's similar to most of the organizations that operate in this space, both in BC and in other parts of Canada. In addition to beverage containers, we also uh, act as a service provider to the Electronic Products Association, um, where we provide all their collection infrastructure and manage their collection and logistics, as well as the major appliances recycling roundtable, the program responsible for recycling major appliances. And we essentially provide back office functions, so accounting and, and auditing function for them. In terms of our membership, really five members of organizations are who form the basis for our organization. Say Beverage Association, Juice Council of BC, Retail Council of Canada, Canadian Bottle Water Association, and Beverage Alcohol Containers Management Council of BC. Just briefly, um, beverage containers in the system, we're responsible for any liquid that is ready to serve steel drink, except for milk and milk substitutes. I should note that the government is currently in consultation. That consultation just wrapped up on September 30th. And one of their recommendations, one of the recommendations they were consulting on, was adding milk and milk substitutes to the deposit program. Um, we're also not responsible for beer and aluminum can to refill the glass, and that's because there's a separate steward for a distributor who represents the beer industry. Uh, they're responsible for managing those containers. In terms of corporate governance, I think this is important um, in terms of looking at EPR. So we have nine board members, seven industry members who are appointed by those five members I talked about. And then we also have two unrelated members, unrelated directors. And so those unrelated directors are recruited, um, particularly on the basis of uh, trying to provide additional two things. One is providing independent views so that the board doesn't become solely just industry focused, but is conscious of other viewpoints outside the industry, but also bring to bear skills that may not be um, um, existing among the current industry members. And so by practice, um, we usually have an uh, accountant or a lawyer or some sort of governance expert. Those unrelated members by practice typically chair both our audit and governance committees, and that's in practice certainly today. In addition to the board, we also have an advisory committee. And so that represents uh, local governments, uh, recycling NGOs, citizens, uh, depots, and small brand owners. And that group has the ability to provide a report every year and make recommendations to the board about the program. And we're just in the process of updating the terms of reference for that committee. In terms of our stewardship obligation, we need to file a stewardship plan every five years. Uh, under the recycling regulation, we must meet a minimum of 75% recovery rate. We must provide convenient access to collection points. We have some consumer awareness targets to meet, as well as there's a consultation process we must go when we're putting out our stewardship plan. In terms of reporting requirements, uh, we have to provide an we have to provide an, uh, audited financial statements, as well as recovery rate and non-financial audits, and all of that is included in annual reports of the Ministry of Environment. So, what's important to note is 
Um, under the recycling regulation, we have to, because we have visible fees, we must make our financial statements uh, public, both during and report and through report to the Ministry of Environment. But then we also have auditors review some key uh, non-financial um, performance targets. So all the information used to calculate a recovery target must be reviewed by independent auditors who need to sign off on that, as well as our collection points must be validated by an independent auditor. And then the end fate of our materials, we must provide access to both source documents as well as facilities so that independent auditors can actually verify and validate that where we set the material ended up actually ended up and was recycled. I think that is rather unique in the stewardship world, at least in North America. And I think it's actually a very effective way for the government to ensure appropriate oversight and that what's supposed to happen under recycling regulation is happening without adding and creating more work for government, which in our view is not always the best, uh, the best use of their resources that are. So we've been very happy with this sort of model. Um, and certainly we think that the independent auditors provide the right level of verification and oversight. And certainly we have to make that report available to government and they can question uh, details on that report and, and ask for further information if required. In terms of system infrastructure for Encore, we have 170 independently owned depots. Um, that represents 90% of our volume. Retail uh, makes up about 7% of our volume. That's through 350 grocery stores and 220 government liquor stores. Again, that means we're recycling about 1 billion containers a year, about 77.4% recovery rate, and that equates to about 95,000 metric tons, as well as 25,000 tons of electronics. Um, it's also important to know that we do extensive consumer awareness. That includes um, public information tools and social media, outreach programs. Uh, we'll do specific programs around education and awareness, uh, partnerships and community support programs, and then use of traditional and non-traditional media. Typically, our budget, our annual budget, will be between three to four million dollars, and that equates to around somewhere in the neighborhood of about 60 cents to 80 cents per person um, across BC. Um, and over 25 years, we've built a rather recognizable brand that I would say would be in the between 96 and 98 percent consumer awareness across the province. As I talked before, we have to actually um, have independent auditor, auditors verify what happens to our material. What's happening today is about 100% of, well, of our new aluminum can is actually managed in a facility in Kentucky, and we do that in partnership with all the deposit programs in the country. We actually operate as a selling group, a selling cooperative to sell our material. Um, that, all that deposit uh, containers from across uh, Canada equate to about two weeks uh, feed stock for the one facility in Kentucky, so that gives you some idea of scale. 100% of our plastic is processed at our partner Maryland Plastics, either in BC or Alberta, the neighboring province. 90% uh, of our new of our glass goes to new wine bottle glass uh, through a uh, facility in Seattle, with the remainder to sample that's being used as stand glass material in BC. And then aseptic and gable top, so tetra pack and gable top cartons. It's the only material currently uh, going outside uh, either Canada and the US, and that's going to facilities in South Korea, and just really in recognition of the fact that we don't have facilities like that on the west coast of, um, of Canada or the US. Uh, probably would be a different situation if we're in the Midwest or on the East Coast. In terms of the benefits of the BC model, and this would apply to both packaging as well as the deposit program, um, we really see this as an opportunity to create reverse supply chain to manage materials with opportunities for standardization and optimization. I want to emphasize how important that is in um, an economy where packaging, both in the beverage side and on the consumer packaging side, is changing very quickly. It also supports a circular economy where producers have influence on both creation and end of life management of the material. I think one of the things for us to all understand is if we want producers to do things differently, it's hard for them to do that if the system that they're trying to manage for isn't communicating with them and providing opportunities to have their material collected and recovered. And so, you know, having this kind of model where producers can actually work with the system in a much more proactive way, I think is actually going to lead to the outcomes we want to see. Is that happening today in BC? Certainly there's parts of it. Um, would that be more commonplace if the BC model was used in other jurisdictions as well? Absolutely. And we're certainly seeing in Canada more and more jurisdictions moving to a 100% EPR model. Um, we also think the benefit the BC model provides producers with the best long-term opportunity to manage their material in light of increasing costs, volatile commodity markets, and continued innovation in packaging types of materials. I think anyone that's watching recycling over the last year knows about the impact of China, knows that this had huge impacts on local recycling programs, 
and really, you know, it, it's going to impact producers in the long term in terms, at least well, in the short term, in terms of their material not being recycled or recovered, but maybe in the long term as well in terms of not providing the kind of systematic approach that would lead to investments in domestic recycling capacity that can handle that material. Uh, so, and, and lead to the um, opportunities for use of recycled content. In terms of impact on these values, I think to maximize the benefits of EPR, producers require control of the system in order to develop and optimize a reverse supply chain. That's really what you want, again, to have that, that circular model. Producers need to have influence on both the, the creation as well as the design of recovery. That transition can be difficult. Uh, but as we proved in BC, it can be managed as long as you have collaboration from industry and local governments. It was not an easy process, but I think if you went and asked municipalities five years after the program started whether they're happy with its choice, that it's undoubtedly they would say yes, uh, in part because of the changes in China. Um, they no longer have to deal with um, managing those markets. They're insulated because it's the producer organization Recycle BC that has to take on those, those challenges. And I think for most municipalities, that ended up being a very positive choice. In and terms of yeah, how yeah, many yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, Andy, and quick question. You talk about the producers having control of the system and, and control of the supply chain. Do they actually take, uh, in essence, possession of the material? Is that the material is then managed by Recycle BC, correct? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so Recycle BC, so municipalities are still protesting. They typically produce data as collectors, and then all the material is sent to processors that have a contract with Recycle BC, and those processors are responsible for um, sorting, processing, and marketing that material on behalf of Recycle BC. And so the municipalities are absolved from having to uh, take on any role or any exposure for that process. And it, just to end, I think a key requirement is to provide municipalities with a range of choices and timelines. I think in the BC system, for a range of reasons, unfortunately, we were rushed. But we did try, try and provide um, municipalities with choices. And I think in the end, that was a positive approach. And so some municipalities came to the table later than others. Um, but the ability for them to choose their destiny, I think, was a key requirement in making the program successful. In terms of what I think are requirements for effective EPR, um, you should have outcomes-based legislation, so provide the industry with specific targets, and then the flexibility to develop the most efficient and effective approach. So in BC, both in the deposit program and on uh, the Recycle BC patching program, industry has developed a system. Uh, for Encore, we've uh, developed a network of independently owned, 170 independently owned depots to manage our materials. In the Recycle BC program, they've effectively created a waste shed for all the packaging materials in the province through the residential system, and they've taken existing infrastructure and revamped it to uh, allow for consolidation. We've, we've got a large province, a million square uh, kilometers, and so they've revamped uh, the facility to allow for consolidation at certain points, and then to manage uh, most of the material, particularly the containers, uh, through uh, network of, uh, small network of facilities in the lower mainland. And I think by managing things on a province-wide basis, they've not only made the system more uh, effective and efficient, but they've also made it um, adapted or made it so it can easily be adapted for future changes to packaging. A second point would be stewardship agencies need strong governance, and I think there needs to be a balance of industry representation and independent directors. And by independent directors, I really think, you know, these organizations respond are, can be huge operations that are managing a lot of money. And so they need to have experienced corporate directors that have the understanding of how to manage, of how to provide strong oversight to these organizations from a financial perspective, as well as from an operational perspective. And again, the third be effective oversight, and as I talked about before in BC, third party audits, uh, three independent auditors are required for both financial and non-financial information. And I think that's provided effective oversight for making sure that the organizations are doing what they were intended to do when they were created. In terms of what's next, I'm just going to add these as, as quickly and then I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, while it's great to have a program that's been up and running for 25 years, we're conscious that consumers are changing. And so we decided to change our basic core model. So we moved away from a system where consumers need to come to a depot and, and sort their containers and stand in line and get their deposit. Now uh, consumers are able to drop off mixed bags of containers. Uh, the containers are then sorted and counted at the depot. And then their refund is actually uploaded to an online account they've created through our program. Once that uh, account reaches $10, uh, consumers are able to redeem their uh, refund through an online, um, through an electronic funds transfer, an email money transfer. 
Um, we found huge increased satisfaction with that program. And uh, over this past year, we've actually added 40,000 registrants with the goal of having 100,000 registrants in the program by next year. Just want to give you an idea, this is actually a depot in the Yale Town area in downtown Vancouver. So the surrounding area for this depot would all be 20 story plus condo buildings. This is actually in the bottom of a condo building. The depot size is about 700 square feet and people can only drop off express or bag containers and there are no cash refunds. So all the refunds are done by email money transfer. Another thing we've done is express and go, uh, which is essentially taking a seat canister and revamping it as a depot. This smaller format is something we're hoping to use for rural areas that don't have the population uh, to, to actually warrant or uh, support a full-time depot. Uh, so these seat containers offer access to the um, community and can be cleaned out um, you know, once or twice a week um, and, and don't have to be staffed. And we think this smaller format, again, will be not only for smaller rural regions, but also in dense um, urban regions where it's just not, we're just not able to access a commercial location to locate a depot. And then finally, we introduced a textile collection. So part of our um, program is trying to make as much use of the shared infrastructure that we have. So we have this network of 171 depots. So on our own, and this is not done through EPR, but actually a voluntary program that we've put forward. We've actually developed a textile collection program. We now have 40 um, participating locations, all in the lower mainland, Greater Vancouver area. And in the six months we've had the program, we've already collected 1,200 bags and diverted 20 metric tons from textiles. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping to double or triple that in the next year. And if you have any more information, you can go to our website, returnit.ca. Lots of information, not only about our veterans program, as well as our electronics, major plants, and textile programs as well. Great, that was uh, very helpful. And I have a quick question. So if you were talking about uh, the reverse supply chain model, uh, can you say a little more about that, uh, how it works? I mean, is it through the governance council? Uh, what's the, the sort of the flow of information in terms of making it a successful model? So in terms of the reverse supply chain, it's really just, you know, in the, um, what you're trying to do is the challenge with recycling for the most part is it's being um, done in an ad hoc manner by each municipality in a different way. By creating a supply of reverse supply chain, you develop consistencies and standards throughout the system that allow the system to work in a much more efficient manner. So if I take PPP Recycle BC as an example, some of the things that have been done is um, the material list has been standardized for the entire province. So every municipality works with the same material list. This means that all the processors know essentially what kind of material mix they get, and that's going to be the same amount they're getting material from the north of the province, the south of the province, or from the local part, the lower mainland. It also means you can treat the material differently as you move through the supply chain. So in the past, you would have tried to sort everything in one facility, um, because then you would have sorted a different for each collector because it was different material. In the BC system, you can consolidate the material because you know it's all the same. And really in the BC system, how it moves to the supply chain is the material is collected. It then goes to some sort of consolidation facility where it gets separated into two streams, uh, paper and then containers. Uh, paper is traditionally um, bailed and marketed as quickly as possible. And so it would go from that consolidation facility right to a marketing facility and, and sent to offshore primarily. The containers would all be bailed and then sent down to one container recycling facility established in uh, New Westminster, which is at the core of the Metro Vancouver area. And all the containers from across the province, roughly 40,000 tons of containers each year, would be sorted at that facility into their respective material groups. So the aluminum would be sorted in aluminum, uh, gable top into gable top, and each of the different plastic categories would be separated into its, into its each in a separate category. And any deposit containers that end up um, captured in that system would also be sorted out, and then with an, through an agreement we have with the processor that works on behalf of Recycle BC, those containers would be returned to our program and we would provide them with the appropriate deposits for that. So I think the idea of the supply chain is to replicate what we often do in the commercial sector, whereas we try and develop these supply chains for you know, distributing and providing goods to a network of stores in an efficient manner. The reverse supply chain is just trying to do the, the reverse. And like other, like other supply chains, trying to standardize and optimize the system to make it work in a more efficient manner. All right. um, any other committee questions? Or Mr. Ongen, right? 
So uh, thank you again for your uh, your help today. Okay, my pleasure. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Hi, uh, hi, this is Rachel. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you great. This is Chris Brown. You are uh, on speakerphone and are in room 10 in the State House with about 60 other folks and uh, Hale. So um, the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the commission. Um, I, uh, my name is Rachel Cabrillion. I'm a former state legislator uh, from neighboring Massachusetts. Uh, I now work for McDonald's Corporation, write a government relations for Vermont and, and five other New England states. McDonald's is proud to count 26 restaurants throughout the state of Vermont, where we employ over 2,000 people from Brattleboro to St. Albans. My comments today will be brief, I promise, uh, but it will be specifically focused on packaging and recycling. Though on, other, on another occasion, I can also describe for members of Vermont legislature, the executive, policy leaders, this commission, um, ways in which McDonald's is also working to combat climate change by setting science-based targets to significantly reduce our greenhouse emissions. So, as you can imagine, we're McDonald's, pretty big company, um, and manufacturing and transporting for over 37,000 restaurants in more than 100 countries does require significant natural resources, including water, trees, fossil fuels, and, and more. And how can we work as a company um, to see that the impact in Vermont and indeed the world uh, is as small as possible? Well, uh, McDonald's is on something of a sustainability journey. And it has never been as important to consider every step for greener policies and practices in our restaurants and throughout the organization. So why does it matter what McDonald's does? Um, it's just a company. Well, by 2025, the World Bank said to me a staggering 6 million tons of waste will be produced every day. What's more, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and World Economic Forum predicts that by 2050, Oceans will contain more plastic than fish. As the world's largest restaurant company, McDonald's has the responsibility and opportunity to take action on some of the most pressing social and environmental challenges in the world. We know that our global supply, supply chains can have a significant impact on the planet, and we're constantly improving our sourcing, packaging, and transportation processes to lessen that footprint. And as I mentioned, when you operate over 37,000 restaurants in more than 100 countries, serving 69, 69 million people every day, even small changes can make a difference and even move the needle. Our customers tell us that their number one environmental concern for us to address in the environmental space is the impact of McDonald's restaurant packaging and waste. And I'm, and I'm here today by video in Vermont to say that we're listening globally and locally. One of the latest and most tangible steps in this ongoing journey are our 2025 goals to improve our packaging and reduce waste, such that by 2025, 100% of McDonald's guest packaging is, will, be, will, will come from renewable, recycled, or certified sources. Also by 2025, our goal is to recycle guest packaging in 100% of McDonald's restaurants we understand that recycling infrastructure, regulations, and consumer behaviors vary from state to state, city to city, country to country, but we plan to be part of the solution wherever we are and help influence powerful change. Together with employees, franchisees, and suppliers, the company is committed to use our Scale for Good initiative to make changes that our customers want and that will have a meaningful impact in all the communities we serve. Our vision is nothing less that transformative. In fact, our sustainable packaging and customer recycling work supports the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, a global agenda and poverty, protect the planet, and human prosperity for all. I will not go into the entire report at this meeting, but I would like to specifically reference the following goals. Goal 12, responsible consumption and production. Goal 14, life above, life below water. And goal 17, partnerships for the, for the goals and specifically um, consumer goals um, recycling um, are mapped directly to the company's Scale for Good initiative. 
And now before this commission, I want to go over our packaging and recycling journey. This dates back to 25 years ago when McDonald's established a partnership with, environmental, with the Environmental Defense Fund. Since beginning that partnership, McDonald's not only phased out polystyrene sandwich boxes, but has also significantly reduced our environmental impact by cutting solid waste and streamlining material choices. The initiative eliminated more than 300 million pounds of packaging, recycled 1 million tons of fluoridated boxes, and reduced waste by 30% in a decade following the partnership. Then, in 2014, McDonald's set its first global goal to reduce waste and recycle more. The company joined World Wildlife Fund's Global Forest and Trade Network program and set its fiber sourcing targets to source all fiber for packaging from recycled or certified sources by 2020. McDonald's restaurants across 12 of our top 16 markets globally, which of course includes the United States market, have introduced programs and partnerships to reduce partnership to reduce litter and increase recycling in their communities. In some communities with recycling infrastructure and local regulation, McDonald's restaurants offer customer-facing recyclers, but just sorting things will collect guest waste and sort it for recycling behind the counter. Many of these McDonald's restaurants offer environmental messages in their lobbies. As of 2017, 50% of McDonald's guest packaging comes from renewable recycled or certified sources. We've also made significant progress on fiber-based packaging, which comprises the vast majority of what we use. And as of 2018, 70% of McDonald's fiber-based guest packaging comes from certified or recycled sources. Now we are rethinking our packaging by working with packaging specialists to reduce material volume wherever possible and designing packaging to recapture the value of materials through recycling which minimizes the cost and environmental impact associated with this disposal. And so what do these actions look like? As we work to achieve our 2025 goals, we're setting milestones and making progress along the way. We aim to support 100% of fiber-based packaging from all certified recyclable sources. And as by 2018, we're 70% away way toward that goal and making more progress every day. From 2018 on, all centrally managed guest packaging is fully out of foam. We are foam free. It is a requirement now that markets do not use foam for any local guest packaging items. While the majority of our foam was removed years ago, we're proud that this important step has been reached to raise the bar for our system and the industry. Additionally, we're proud that behind the counter and our kitchens and serving points, Crews are recycling used cooking oil and cardboard in up to 85 to 90 percent of McDonald's restaurants. And while we've made a lot of progress, there are more recycling challenges to overcome. On the customer side, promoting recycling is not always as straightforward as we might think. Recycling infrastructure, regulations, and consumer behavior vary from city to city, and there's tremendous variability in how waste and recycling tracks and measures waste volume, making it different, difficult to capture important data. It's going to take a lot of work, and but we are resolved to be a part of the solution wherever we operate and help influence change. One of our, our current uh, challenges is called the Next Gen Cup Challenge. In 2018, McDonald's joined forces with Starbucks as a convening member of Next Gen Consortium and Cup Challenge to develop a fiber to go cup and create a fully and widely recyclable and or compostable cup in collaboration with closed loop partners. The Next Gen Cup Challenge was open to supply chain leaders, <coughs> innovators, solution providers, and anyone with promising solutions to recover single use cups. The 12 winners were announced in February of this year, and six will now enter an accelerator program to help scale their solutions and bring about our next gen cup. And said we are setting goals and making progress every day. As one of the world's largest restaurant companies, McDonald's has set ambitious goals to use less packaging, promote values of circularity in our packaging design, drive innovation in sustainable packaging and recycling, and engage millions of customers thousands of communities in Colorado to adopt recycling behaviors as the norm. We're rethinking our packaging, as I described in the next gen cup, working with packaging specialists to reduce material volumes, and we 
know that these efforts will not be successful unless there is a strong recycling infrastructure. So, to make to note our progress on our goal one of 2025, 100% McDonald's guest packaging will come from renewable, recyclable, and certified sources. We are 70% there. We're fully out of foam, so we're making our goals or we're keeping our promises. And in our goal of 2025 to recycle guest packaging of 100% of our restaurants, we are now recycling guest packaging an estimated 10% of McDonald's restaurants around the world. And in some markets, we're recycling at nearly 100% of our location. I don't have those numbers right now for the line, but I will get them to the committee when I get them. I just didn't get them in time for this meeting. So I apologize, I will get them. Um, this results um, in the recycling infrastructure, use of secondary materials, regulations, and consumer behaviors, variability um, results in us to happen. Some of it's more challenging than we may like. Um, and we want to make sure we capture as much data as possible and use best practices that we've seen in our various markets. And in summary, we are always looking to improve at McDonald's in all of our environmental practices. These ambitious goals demonstrate McDonald's commitment to Vermont and where, in wherever we do business to make the environmental stewardship synonymous with the McDonald's brand. We want to use our sustainability goals and skill for good to always keep raising the bar and what it means to be a responsible company and responsible businesses committed to people and the planet. The opportunity is now. We're looking forward to showing you what's next and working with members of the commission and people in Vermont from all sectors of policy um, and, and, uh, uh, and advocacy and hopefully that's all the other goals. So I'm happy to answer any questions if I can. Um, but I, we really appreciate the ability uh, to tell you what we're doing um, at, at McDonald's. Uh, thank you very much. We do have some a few questions here. Uh, Lauren. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for calling in and for sharing uh, what you're working on. One question I had that um, is part of the charge of this group that I didn't hear reference at all um, is the intersection with the use of toxic chemicals in packaging. And we know, for example, that PFAS chemicals, which we've had some PFAS water contamination issues in Vermont, as the entire nation and globally is struggling with. Uh, I'm just curious what your, you know, do you know if there's PFAS, if you're moving to a lot of paper, often that's coated with a PFAS um, containing um, coating, and just curious what you can share about you know, how that plays into your sustainability goals and requirements, and, and is that an issue that you're also addressing as you address this? Uh, thank you. Um, as you can imagine, I have to look at lots of uh, different bills from all over the country, in particular in New England. And anytime there's been a PFAS bill, it's never been um, a bill that affects anything that we're doing at McDonald's. Um, so we are more advanced think, than a lot of other companies. Um, but I can get you a little more specific that there's any PFAS anywhere um, and sort of where we fit with the um, with some of the measures that some of the legislation and that your commission is trying to um, trying to, to get to get to. Um, this is Chris. I have a question about um, use of post-consumer waste in your packaging. So uh, does McDonald's get um, are all, is all your packaging created by others, or are you so vertically integrated that you actually create some of your own? Um, I think it's mostly with supply partners, um, and we're always you know, challenging our supply partners uh, to be as progressive as they can on environmental packaging. Um, I think it's safe to say that among companies, certainly major American companies, that we are leading the way and having you know, the most, some of the most sustainable and, and up-to-date um, kind of packaging. Um, there, there's lists. Uh, I can probably you know, speak to you or your staff offline if you have um, anything more specific. Um, but in general, it's, it's not so vertical that we don't use our supply, supply partners. Sure. And I think sure. what I'm, we've talked some about kind of the chicken and egg problem of having uh, post-consumer waste valued enough to be um, become sustainable in terms of economics and so one side of the equation is looking at um, packaging that's created with a post-consumer waste uh, specification so that ends up driving the market and then sustaining the recycling industry that partners with it and I'm just wondering if you if in your work as you move to more post-consumer waste or more recycled content, 
if you're, um, you know, if you're in dialogue basically with your vendors saying we want a higher, uh, higher specification, higher percentage, can you create such a product? Are you um, helping design the packaging that's created for you that way? Very much so. Um, and we're trying to get ahead of it and lead with some of the best technology on um, post consumer material. Um, from what I, I saw on the phone yesterday with a sustainability person, a lot of states, at least some of mine, are doing a lot of municipal regulations. And we have a supply chain to keep up with it, with the exception of a total ban on straws. If there was like a total ban on plastic straws around the country, there aren't enough alternative straws being produced on planet Earth to supply all the McDonald's at this moment in time. So we are working on alternative straws uh, as well and trying to lead in that space as we're beginning to meet them, you know, town by town, or in some cases, you know, I think it'll be city-wide bans um, on straws. So some of it is just um, keeping up with um, the ability to supply and technology, um, and we want to be as, as ahead on that as we can be. But so far, supply chain has met any of the municipal regs, and some of them have been pretty stringent. And um, as Vermont moves forward, uh, from your perspective, what can Vermont do while we're, you know, intent on making progress that's helpful to uh, a corporation like McDonald's? What sort of the productive route we can pursue versus one that you would call, you know, uh, challenging or problematic? Well, one of the ways that I think we've added to the dialogue is um, in trying to um, describe our journey, for example, um, and this isn't a, a packaging recycling matter, but menu labeling. Menu labeling came up, the restaurant industry all over the you know country got very nervous about doing it and you know what kind of liability would there be. And McDonald's moved ahead years ahead of time and did all its menu labeling and then served as a resource uh, to other you know restaurant chains and other entities who were grappling with that to say, hey, it wasn't so bad, this is how we did it. Um, and trying to kind of move policy when we've already discovered uh, practice and a journey, uh, particularly if, if it matches with the company's values. And the company's values is to be a progressive company environmentally, um, lead, um, and be a part of the solution. And the climate change, some of the climate change measures particularly not uh, impressive with some of the large scale things that are happening for another day. Um, but how we can share our experience as you're trying to pass um, uh, legislation or policies that we already have experience with. We're happy to, to share that with our with our colleagues in business. Okay, great. Any okay. other uh, committee questions? Yeah. Rachel, Andy Hackman. Uh, question for you. So we've had some discussion within the group or within the, the working group around uh, reusability and, and trying to force establishments to use reusable mm -hmm. utensils and containers. Does that pose a challenge at all for you guys? Um, that does because there's a lot of there are a lot of food safety measures that McDonald's adheres to um, that are part of our practices and even just some health codes that are variable. Um, it depends, uh, but when we have had reusable on a, on a bag. We've pushed uh, against that um, because of, of the um, health concerns. Uh, but it's something I'm happy to talk to to members of the committee about. Uh, more extensively, because you know, I think the companies um, respond to a lot of things. It's like, well, maybe not know, but maybe not. Maybe it's more not yet. And how can we possibly get there? So we're open to other discuss the discussion. But yes, it has yeah. some problems. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and we have another question. Yeah, Kathy Davidson from the EC. So, um, with um, being such a large global restaurant that does generate so much material that can get out into the environment. What is the single best thing McDonald's can do to make sure that when the material leaves the McDonald's restaurant, it will not cause an environmental impact? Um, well, it's, it's some of what I described were just sort of just practices that we have, have our restaurant have to adhere to. Um, it's a kind of a big, uh, a big subject. There's, um, right, but recyclability is not going to solve that in that plastics will break down into microplastics or nanoplastics. So just being able to have recyclable plastics won't solve that. And so that's one of the things, one of the charges of this group is to make sure that these materials 
minimize environmental impact. Yeah. And we're looking for solutions. Yeah, um, well, I'm happy to um, go to some of my colleagues in sustainability and see if they have more uh, specific ideas in mind. Uh, but like, it is sort of a multi-pronged approach. Uh, better materials, you know, more recyclable, um, and fewer materials. Right, fewer is important. Okay. Yeah, fewer is a good goal, and uh, there's plenty of uh, disposable out there in the world, and we don't want to add more. Any other committee questions? All right. Well, thank you very much for um, uh, zooming in today. <laughs> well, thank you for letting me zoom in. Uh, I will be there again in person. So thank you so much. All right. Have a good day. Bye. Hello. 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 Well, thank you very much for the opportunity um, to speak today to the single-use products working group. Um, my name is Katie Riley. I work for the Consumer Technology Association. Okay. And I have your presentation here. Oh, you it, did, it didn't stick in the system, so it didn't print, and it didn't uh -huh. post. But we fixed it, and so now it is. Everyone has a copy. Okay, well, there's not a whole lot on the presentation. There were just kind of general slides, so sorry if everybody's getting a few for copies, because we have to some waste. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. It's not the first ironic thing that happened. Yeah. <laughs> Usually it's legislator in use. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Okay. Thanks, you come? Uh, sure. <laughs> and there's more coming for the table. Um, well, thank you again for the opportunity to speak here today in front of the um, working group. My name is Katie Riley. I work for the Consumer Technology Association. We go by the <laughs> CTA. Um, I submitted longer comments. Hopefully, you all have a copy of those. So I'm going to keep my testimony today. I only have about 10 minutes. I'm going to keep it a little more focused um, than what I elaborate on in the written comments themselves. But I guess if you want to turn to page two, um, a quick introduction to who CTA is. So we are the trade association that represents the U.S. consumer technology industry. Right, so like I was saying, uh, we are the trade association that represents the U.S. consumer technology industry. Our member of the world's, um, our members of the world's leading innovators, from startup companies to a lot of the global brands that you guys probably know and use on a daily basis. Um, and we help support more than 18 million jobs here in the U.S. Um, our members have long been recognized for their commitment, um, leadership, and innovation and sustainability, often taking measures to exceed regulatory requirements on environmental design, energy efficiency, and product and packaging stewardship. Um, so I go into a little more length in my written comments, but I just wanted to start off with a slide that shows sort of the four major areas of consideration that our members take into account when designing packaging for their consumer electronic devices. Um, there are two that I really want to focus on specifically for my short time today. Um, the first is the overarching concern in the consumer technology industry as a durable goods industry that packaging must protect the high value products that we're shipping out. Um, when we're talking about shipping servers to businesses that cost tens of thousands of dollars, or we're talking about that high value laptop that's going to a consumer's home, um, the fact that that packaging has to serve the role of protecting the product is of the utmost importance to our member companies. Um, additionally, for small, small high value electronic devices, um, packaging also does serve the role of product protection um, from the perspective of theft. We want to make sure in a retail setting that those high value smaller devices aren't stolen off of retail store shelves. Um, and then the second consideration that I wanted to touch on um, was the bottom right of sustainability. So over time, um, as an industry, our products, our electronic devices, have gotten lighter and smaller, which means that in general, we've seen a significant reduction in the use of packaging um, among our member companies. In addition, our members have made a lot of voluntary goals um, to make their packaging more sustainable. So whether that's sustainably sourced materials, whether that's recyclability and compost goals, or working, whether they're looking at it from a greenhouse gas emissions reduction. Um, in my written testimony, and I, hopefully if you go online and look at it, you'll see links to our sustainability report for CTA, where you can gain a little more information on what some individual companies are doing. Um, but given both of these two uh, considerations that are of the utmost importance, um, we really look at them together, product protection and sustainability together. And that's because it plays an important role in reducing 
reducing the environmental costs that occur when a product's actually damaged. So damaged goods from the consumer technology industry, they can have 10 times minimum the environmental costs when those products are damaged from a carbon footprint standpoint. So that's why it's so important for us to ensure that high value items like this don't get damaged in transport. Um, I'll kind of gloss over this page. I believe we're actually going to hear from the Recycling Partnership after my presentation today. Um, but these are just a couple examples of some of the um, voluntary industry supported efforts that are happening when we talk about packaging in general. Um, if you have any specific questions about any of these um, organizations or the work that they're doing, I'm happy to, I'm happy to follow up after this meeting as well on those. Um, but what I really wanted to come here today and touch on a little bit, and Kathy, I'm sure you're <laughs> pretty aware of this, um, is I wanted to bring the perspective of um, to address extended producer responsibility, um, given that one of the focuses of this task force or this working group um, is to examine whether an EPR program would improve the management of single-use products in Vermont. Um, I really wanted to bring our industry's experience um, here today to share with you all. Um, so as you can see from this map, um, we have 24 states, including Mont Vermont, um, plus the District of Columbia, that have implemented EPR programs for electronics. Um, I think it's safe to say we are the industry with the most experience with EPR here in the US. And what we've seen is a patchwork of laws, each one varying in scope significantly um, in some cases, that have proven both costly and inefficient across jurisdictions for the electronics industry. Um, we've spent well over a billion dollars complying with these various laws, and our key takeaway from that experience is that we do strongly caution against a state-by-state -state approach for managing packaging materials, similar to what we've seen with electronics. Um, so our experience has found that EPR programs oftentimes do have some unintended consequences of putting extreme pressure on local recycling markets. Um, these adverse effects that we've seen on these local markets have had some long-term negative impacts on um, long-term sustainability of local recycling jobs around the country. Um, local governments must typically surrender control over their collection and recycling systems. And additionally, um, EPR structures, you know, they operate outside the normal market influences. So what we see is the resulting winners and losers are being chosen by stewardship organizations and leaving others unable to operate outside the structures that these EPR programs create. Um, ultimately, this lack of market forces with EPR tends to lead to higher costs for the collection and recycling system as a whole. Um, specific to Vermont, um, since we are here today, it's a great example. Um, the Vermont Electronic Waste Program, or Vermont E-Cycles Program, we should use the proper term, is one of the, has one of the highest per pound rates in the country that we see among these programs. Um, and it's because the Vermont system is not market-based, um, the Department of Environmental Conservation, they have sole control over selecting the program administrator and recyclers um, under the state standard plan. DEC approves the price for recycling based on submitted applications, not market pricing. And then the program bills manufacturers at non-competitive rates. Um, the Vermont Collection Infrastructure, and I actually used to work for one of the recyclers that participated in the Vermont State Standard Plan. And the collection infrastructure for electronics is some of the costliest in the U.S with no incentive for collectors to strive toward efficiencies. And so this, this isn't a pattern that's necessarily unique to Vermont, I will say that. Um, we have seen this in other similarly structured programs here in the US. Um, but additionally, and thankfully this has not happened in Vermont, but we've also seen where EPR programs in other states have ended up approving recyclers under their programs that have gone out of business and abandoned cathode ray tube or CRT um, stockpiles. So I just kind of want to stress with all of this that EPR does not always equate to an effective or an efficient system. Um, proponents of EPR also argue that the program does lead to product redesign. Um, as an industry, in our experience with EPR, we've, seen, we've um, not seen it drive design for the environment. Um, progress on this front has been specifically connected to product innovation, consumer demand and preference, and companies' commitments to reduce hazardous material. Um, so CTI, in conjunction with Staples, um, we've been working with the Rochester Institute of Technology's Galasano Institute for Sustainability. And what we've actually found is that while the number of consumer electronic devices um, sold has actually continued to increase, the net material impact of those devices has actually gone down over time and is now down at levels that we haven't seen since the early 1990s. Um, RIT also reported that materials of concern like lead and, cad or lead and mercury have significantly declined even though the general overall material profile has remained relatively steady among our products. 
So I just want to stress that you know these achievements have been driven by innovation and advancements among the in among the industry, not as a result of our industry having to pay for collection and recycling of electronics across multiple jurisdictions. Um, lastly, I do kind of want to point out that product stewardship um, does little to can change consumer behavior. Um, product stewardship is not free, I know all of you know that, that are sitting here today. Um, but where manufacturers can, consumers do end up paying for recycling through the cost of the products they purchase, um, plus any premium markup as those products move through the distribution and retail channels. Um, a concern that we have with product stewardship is that consumers then aren't necessarily directly engaged and actively participating to understand how the recycling system itself works. Um, hidden fees, inevitable distribution change markups, this kind of sends the wrong message to consumers in our opinion um, that recycling is free and we're not creating that ethos that's really needed to support a robust consumer recycling program. Um, so my next slide just kind of addresses some of the challenges of the Vermont E-Cycles program. I, I already addressed those in my conversation. I do want to note um, a lot of these challenges are not unique just to Vermont. I'm not picking on Vermont's program as I'm sitting here. We do see them in many other states, and manufacturers are trying to be proactive. Um, they're currently reaching out to DEC as well as some of the other state programs with concerns and ideas about how to help modernize these programs to help make them more cost-effective and efficient. Um, but lastly, I wanted to wrap up um, talking about my experience serving on the Connecticut Task Force that was tasked with studying methods for reducing consumer packaging that generates solid waste in Connecticut. Um, this task force was established in 2016. We wrapped up our recommendations and released those in February of 2018. Um, and I kind of want to talk through the process a little bit. Um, it was a very well thought out and structured task force. We had over a year of stakeholder meetings in which we heard from stakeholders, expert testimony, public comments. Um, we structured it so that at each meeting we heard from different stakeholder groups, including local governments, industry, which included packaging producers, trade associations, and product manufacturers, um, the NGO community, academia, EPR program representatives from Canada and Europe, um, as well as the waste and recycling community, both national um, and local. And the testimony focused on the impacts of an experience with EPR, as well as alternative programs and policy options for managing and reducing packaging. Um, and really the key finding of this task force was we, or one of the key findings of the task force, was that we did not recommend product stewardship as a means of reducing consumer packaging um, that generates solid waste in Connecticut. Um, a handful of the concerns, you can see them up here. Um, we were worried about creation of a recycling monopoly. We were worried about pushing Connecticut recycling firms out of business. We were worried about increasing costs on the entire collection recycling system as a whole. Um, but one of the other things I also wanted to stress is there was general acknowledgement among all task force members um, that a state-by-state -state approach would not achieve the results touted under other EPR programs in other jurisdictions, you know, specifically Canada and Europe, where the U.S. tends to look, um, state-by-state state approach would not achieve those achievements that we see under some of these other programs. Um, and I think that's really a, a key concept to keep in mind here. Um, I do want to stress, you know, we spent a lot of time and significant resources as a task force member like you all. Uh, I spent a lot of time researching various policy options, including product stewardship, um, prepared questions for the experts that came before our committee. I did a lot of follow-up research as well. Um, and some of the concerns that I raised surrounding were surrounding the potential economic impact and costs of an EPR program. Um, so some of those concerns, um, again, outlined in my written comments, but you know, we didn't have a full analysis of the costs associated with the product stewardship system for Connecticut. There was no understanding of what the full cost of the system was going to be or any cost savings to local governments. Um, we didn't know the full cost of the current collection or recycling system as a whole in Connecticut either. Um, so we couldn't understand if a product stewardship program would achieve any increased um, efficiencies or create any type of economies of scales there. Um, other industries that were currently complying with product stewardship um, laws, not just electronics, but we also have paint and mattresses and carpet, um, they stress that showing the cost to consumer, showing cost to consumers actually sends a signal to the buyer that recycling is not free and something that they felt was important for creating that consumer recycling ethos. Um, and lastly, while acknowledging that an EPR system for packaging could theoretically have a potential to incentivize product design, um, you know, our, one of our co-chairmen did note that, you know, Connecticut alone would not have an impact on design because it's such a small 
portion of the country as well. So these are just some of the concerns and arguments that I, I want you all to keep at the forefront of your mind as you continue your work as a working group, because um, I think a lot of these same arguments and concerns um, translate over here to Connecticut as well. Um, and you know, we encourage you to explore all policy options and take a deep dive into um, cost assessments and economic impact analysis of what these programs could really mean for the state of Vermont and businesses that are doing work here. So I appreciate your time. Um, I thank you very much and I'm happy to answer any questions if any of you if any of you have any. Sure. Um, so I don't want to get into a debate about um, the e-waste program per se, but um, we do have market-based pricing in that our contract goes out to an RFP that is competitively bid, and, and the manufacturers do have an opportunity throughout the law to participate and have their own program to opt out. But let's put that aside. When that program was created in 2010, mm -hmm. the electronics manufacturers were presented an opportunity or an option to manage the program on their own. They declined. They said, no, thank you. We don't want to cooperate or collaborate together. Um, so the legislature chose to have a program that the state implemented. So my question to you today is, would your manufacturers be interested in having a pilot program in Vermont where we are looking at an EPR program or an EPR-like um, program where we are managing the single-use products? Rather than have that in a pilot project like Paint Care did, so that the, you don't get the patchwork of 24 different programs throughout the country, but Paint Care saw what happened to e-waste, and then they were strategic, and they piloted it out in three states, an EPR program, and they're replicating that same program throughout the country, so they, they don't have to manage those things. So my question to manufacturers are, are you willing to pilot the program? I can't say that at that at this point in time, if we are or if we aren't. Um, I will say, obviously, um, you know, we uh, the discussions around e-waste. It's we had a lot of division among the industry as these programs were initially being discussed and talked about. Um, so I'm just here, you know, several ten plus years later to talk about what our experience is with with what resulted from I think some of the inability at times of industry to come together and decide well, the path they wanted to move forward. <laughs> The reality, yeah, the reality is um, we're the, what's the phrase, the dog wagging the tail, the tail wagging the dog. Um, the consumer technology industry, we're just a small component when we come, when it, when we come to the discussions of the overall packaging industry. And I think there's a lot of discussions and maybe that's a great opportunity um, as part of this working group to have more representatives from the overall consumer product goods industry come together and talk about whether or not that is a viable option, whether or not having them if there's any interest in sitting down and looking at a pilot type program. Um, unfortunately, I think in this scenario, consumer technology is not necessarily the one that's going to be driving it given that we're, you know, the packaging that we put on the market is such a small component of, I think, what we're talking about among this overall working group. Um, but it's an interesting idea and I think it's a good food for thought to take back to a lot of the trade associations. I mean, another strategy to address a patchwork is to go to the federal government and ask for national legislation. Is your organization working at the federal level to have a uniform standard? So we are not at this moment in time. We are speaking with several um, congressional offices. Um, as you can imagine, there's not a lot happening uh, at the congressional level right now. There is an interest, obviously, in recycling that we are seeing among several of the congressional offices at this point in time. And we are talking with them about what options might exist for federal approaches to help manage um, consumer, consumer material, consumer recyclables, specifically packaging. Uh, Laura? So, I mean, you pointed out some inefficiencies. I mean, bottom line, do the EPA start EPR? <laughs> Senate producers want really states recycle more electronics than the non EPR states. I can't say that for sure because um, a lot of states don't track. Well, I mean, the states that they don't have an EPR program aren't necessarily tracking that data. Would your guess be that they probably recycle? Potentially, I don't. I don't know. I think it all comes down to the collection and recycling infrastructure. We have some EPR programs. Um, you can go on the um, electronic recycling coordination clearinghouse uh, program website, and you can see by state what the recycling rate per capita is. Um, but we don't. We don't have the information from a majority. Of, we don't have the information from states that don't have EPR programs to know how much they're actually 
they're actually recycling. One other quick thing, um, you mentioned at one point the, um, how um, it's not EPR programs that drive things like innovations and you mentioned lead and mercury specifically in design. <laughs> Um, to me, that was just that was a, a good example of you know EPR can could potentially play a role for some things, but I know there's some ideas in front of the group too of still looking at things like bans and other things. There has been quite a bit of legislation around lead and mercury, for example, um, around you know which products can contain it. So I think for us all, uh, I think that was a good example of you know what can EPR realistically do for us, and then what other kind of complementary strategies might be needed to address other issues. Um, I'll pass because I think it's captured with that question. I'm actually Michelle Morris on behalf yes. of Jen Holiday. <laughs> 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 to rephrase um, Lauren's question, if you, understanding you can't track success of an EPR program against a state that never had one, mm -hmm. can you say that there was a significant difference in a state once they implemented EPR for collection of electronics where they had no EPR program previously? I also have not seen any of the before and after data because, again, I don't think a lot of the states were tracking before their programs or after their programs. Um, I mean, it, it is likely that it um, did increase the amount of material that was collected, um, or it's just that now it's actually being tracked. Um, but I think a lot of the questions also come down to, you know, what are the costs associated with the different types of programs and structures um, that are under these programs? Um, where can we be, I think our industry right now is focused on where can we find efficiencies in collection infrastructure, um, and how we can support sustainable programs is really our key focus at this point in time. Mm -hmm. And I would be happy to send you Vermont data because when we did into the EU waste program, it increased three times, threefold. Gotcha. I work for the yeah. I used to work for the state of Indiana over their electronic waste recycling program, um, similar to Vermont eCycles, um, although structured differently. And the state of Indiana never had any data on how many electronics were being collected prior to that program going in place. So I think it's very jurisdiction specific. Okay. Any other committee questions? Thank you. Oh. So one point you stressed was in terms of the balance between packaging and delivering the product. Uh, have you guys done any analysis on the, the potential cost to breakage compared to other consumer goods for your industry? Other compared to other consumer goods? So, yeah, in general, the margin on, on cost to, to for a damaged product and what that impact would be. No, we haven't. Um, it's something that we've actually been talking about looking into as well. Obviously, you know, we're a little bit different than shampoo bottle in terms of if our product gets damaged. Um, there's a significant environmental impact, cost impact, um, versus that shampoo bottle. Not to not putting shampoo bottles under the bus or anything, but you know, we're we're coming at it from the perspective of the durable goods industry. I mean, I think there is a distinction which, when you're talking about shipping a durable good versus a consumable good. Um, but at the same time, you know, there are life cycle impacts of any product, whether it's shampoo or whether it's a laptop, that you're going to experience from a damaged product um, as a result of insufficient packaging. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is Dylan. Hi, Dylan. Uh, this is Chris Bray. I'm uh, calling you from room 10 in the Vermont State House. There's a uh, speaker phone and about 60 of us here, a committee of uh, 10 and a room full of people. Uh, and sorry, we're running just a little behind. Uh, we, totally okay. Uh, we'll be getting your presentation distributed to people around uh, the room and table, and uh, we have it up on a PowerPoint. So the floor is yours. Take it away if you call out slide changes. Uh, Mike on our end will keep pace. Terrific. Well, uh, thank you so much. I'm honored to be able to uh, participate in this working group, and um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to everybody there today. Um, like, again, uh, thank you. Thank you again very much for including us. Um, I'm going to kind of step back and, and say who we are. Um, my name is Dylan DeThomas. I'm VP for Industry Collaboration for the Recycling Partnership. Uh, the Recycling Partnership is a 
national nonprofit 501c3 uh, dedicated to do what this says there on the screen is transforming recycling for good. Maybe you can go to the next slide and I can show who, make, who makes us up. Um, we're an industry funded group. Uh, big brands like Coke and Pepsi and um, big retailers like Amazon and Target, and then all the various folks that make all the various things that go on the store shelves that we want to be able to put back into the recycling system. And we really have a lot of different uh, uh, stakeholder groups, obviously a lot of plastics, but we have a lot of paper, we have a lot of metal, uh, even a little bit of glass um, as represented, uh, you know, in, to help support our mission. If you go to our next slide. And we were formed to get at this central challenge, which is that roughly half the US doesn't have the same level of access to recycling as they do to trash. Um, and then those that do have access to recycling uh, are only recycling half of what they can at the household. Um, and so that's roughly what we were created to try to fix. Um, if you can switch, actually, can switch one slide and then switch to the next slide, I'm going to give a little bit of context on our working model. We do that through four distinct work streams. Uh, the primary work stream, where a, a good deal of our funding goes, is to infrastructure. We give grants to communities to help uh, cart them, so either bring them from no recycling to recycling or to switch from the little 18 gallon totes to larger, easy to use 96 gallon roll carts. Um, we also have given grants for trucks and we are currently uh, trying to uh, identify communities that we can give grants for transfer stations. Um, and then uh, we also offer expert assistance, uh, a great deal of the US uh, recycling coordinators uh, are uh, don't just manage recycling in their community. Oftentimes, the guy who's in charge or gal who's in charge of recycling is also in charge of rabid raccoons, and we uh, we try to make it easy on them and we give them as much help as we can. Um, and we have a, a robust set of free tools and project plans and um, uh, best management practices available on our website, recyclingpartnership.org. And all of the work that we do there is supported by uh, robust data sets uh, where we have, have iterated and tested the work that we've done to be able to improve it. And then lastly, we always try to work uh, within uh, the entire system. Uh, recycling is not a thing. It's not just when you put a, a can or bottle or box into the cart. But um, you know, it, it, it is a, an entire supply chain, and, and we want to make sure that that entire supply chain is healthy, so the recycling system can work better. Uh, the next slide gets into a little bit of our economic impacts. Of, of you know, forty-three million dollars of new uh, infrastructure with uh, city matching. That's that's we always have leveraged grants. We give the dollars uh, for the communities to help. The, they they then unlock those private dollars or those public dollars rather to be able to. Uh, put the carts or trucks on the ground. Um, and then we, uh, uh, you can see a little bit of the other dollar amounts impact. And we've worked, if you go to the next slide, we've worked in over a thousand communities uh, around the US, uh, which has impacted more than 50 million households. We've placed, uh, actually this number is uh, outdated, we've placed more than half a million new recycling carts around the United States and had that uh, that boost in both recycling and obviously the environmental impact that results from uh, the positive environmental impact that results from recycling as we've grown. If you can go to the next slide. And this gives a little picture, you know, the U.S. is obviously very big, and this gives a little picture of where we are doing our work. Um, some of those places are uh, those aforementioned infrastructure grants. Um, and then some is, uh, you know, obviously one of the big challenges, and I'm sure as folks in the room have been talking about this morning, uh, the challenges uh, surrounding contamination and recycling, so people who are recycling things that are not recyclable. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, tools and best management practices and, and, and uh, programs out there to help reduce contamination. And then uh, also working at a regional and state level to help uh, improve recycling system change. Um, and then obviously connect folks. We, we often 
different conferences around the country we bring together recycling professionals uh, to be able to help improve recycling, uh, to share best practices and ideas uh, from different regions of the United States. The first is one of our largest programs working with Atlanta. We have launched uh, recently a three-year, $4 million program with support from the Coca-Cola Foundation. And this is primarily not an infrastructure project, but rather a quality project. Uh, there is a little bit of infrastructure helping make sure that all residents in the Atlanta area have carts, but for uh, the vast majority of it is to help improve the recycling that is occurring in Atlanta. Um, and we are doing uh, cart tagging, which is um, those little carts that you can see there where people are walking out ahead of the recycling, cart, uh, recycling trucks to make sure that what they're putting in the cart uh, is, is appropriate. Um, one of the biggest challenges in Atlanta is bagged recyclables um, because we found that at the sortation facilities in Atlanta, if they have a bag of recyclables, they, they treat it the same as if it's a bag of trash because they don't know what's in it and it can further contaminate the loads and so those are discarded. And so uh, a great deal of the work is trying to get those recyclables into the carts and loose. And uh, we've had a, a great deal of success. We're currently working on that uh, right now uh, across the city in a three-year program. And similar work uh, to the work that I just described in Atlanta is occurring um, statewide in Ohio. We've partnered with the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency uh, to be able to work with large cities in Ohio to do that same work. Uh, we're partnered with MRFs and haulers, or sorry, MRFs being the sortation facilities, material recovery facilities, uh, and haulers in those cities to be able to do the same work. And um, the exciting thing there is that the MRFs themselves are testing the effectiveness of that work, and they've all seen uh, roughly 40% reduction in um, contamination rates, uh, and seen some real great success there. And we're going to be uh, building out that project, again, working statewide in Ohio over the next year. We also are always trying to uh, not just reduce contamination, but also, again, move those carts. We have uh, we had a, a roughly a million dollars uh, that we are giving to uh, carts uh, to communities that are on waterways, and one of those was Sarasota, Florida, um, and not just uh, giving carts. So they used to have bins that were loose, so the recyclables, if a you know wind came by, could uh, escape into the marine or otherwise environment. So the carts obviously have lids and are able to stay closed, and um, they're one of those communities. We also have done some coastal cleanup in Sarasota, as well as uh, some uh, anti-contamination work. And then we are also trying to increase participation. So this is where the, the half of the, the residents that are still throwing out recyclables, this is trying to increase participation in recycling. We've done similar work in Denver. We're working in Newark, which is a dual stream community. Um, and, uh, you know, working, piloting a program in 50,000 communities uh, just started a, a few weeks ago. And um, our goal is to increase participation by 10%, as well as uh, raise recycling awareness in the community. And those results aren't back yet, but it's uh, work that we're working hard on in those communities in Newark. It's measured matters, and we work very hard with the communities that we work with, but also other communities to help measure the success or lack thereof of their recycling programs. This is a uh, partnership we did with a, a software company called Retract Connect um, called the Municipal Measurement Program. It's a free tool that allows uh, communities, any community anywhere to track so they can make sure that they can compare their uh, uh, success to other communities uh, and make sure that they're comparing apples to apples as opposed to apples and pretzels. And that just gives a, a little, little uh, a free tool there um, with a, a link. And then uh, that's a, a brief overview of what we do. Uh, we've done quite a bit, as I mentioned, across the United States. Um, but it's also a big country, and uh, there is a lot of work still to be done. And um, we've, we've worked lightly with, with uh, Vermont in the past. Um, I know that uh, they've used a few of our tools in the past. They've downloaded some of the things that we've used. And we would welcome any other partnership uh, availability that would come our way. Uh, we'll be at the NERC conference next week um, in Providence, and as I'm sure a number of uh, folks in Vermont will be there, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, great. Um, any questions from the committee? 
I, I have one quick one. I mean, I know that your organization's about recycling. Uh, yes, sir. In the scheme of things, we're also talking about reducing from the outset. Do you play any role in with your partner organizations in going upstream to try to reduce the volume of material that needs to be recycled? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Obviously, recycling is the you know third on the waste hierarchy, and and um, you know obviously an important part of what we would hope to be the circular economy. Um, and re reduction and reuse are ahead of it. We are focused currently on recycling just because that's how the system is currently set up. Uh, but it is something that we, we work hard to support. And uh, we work with states like the state of Oregon, their sustainable materials management, uh, the roadway pathway to 2050. Um, we support any states or cities that are able to work on uh, reduction and reuse. But we don't currently have programs because, again, we're, we're, we're the recycling partnership and work with existing solid waste systems. And there aren't a great deal of solid waste systems that, that, um, that deal with reduction and reuse. Um, so I suppose that was a lot of words to say, no, we don't really work in that space. Sorry about that. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, Kathy. Sure. Um, are you aware of any Vermont municipalities that have received funding from your organization for infrastructure? No, that's a great question. Um, I don't have a, a list of all the municipalities that have applied for funding, but I don't believe Vermont is on that list currently. Um, they, our, our grants uh, for the carts in particular are open for any community to, to apply. And we are, uh, apologies, sorry, I, I got a, came a call in at the same time. Um, uh, but I know that Vermont communities have used our tools that we have available on our website, but I don't believe they've applied for funds that they would be el eligible to. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, I'm curious as to whether Recycling Partnership is doing any work on hard to recycle materials, um, in particular, outside of the commonly recycled and recovered materials. I'm sorry, you broke up a little bit. Could you repeat that, please? I'm curious as to whether Recycling Partnership is doing any work on capturing hard to recycle materials apart from the normal fibers um, ah. and containers and packaging that we're already capturing pretty well. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I did not share that slide. We, we did recently launch an initiative called the Film and Flexibles Task Force that is working with both existing and potential uh, uh, programs to be able to capture those materials, film being like a, uh, like a over wrap on toilet paper or your, your plastic shopping bags and then flexibles, which are termed as like the, the pouches that we see at grocery stores a lot. Um, and we're working with different programs to be able to figure out how we can recover those best. Uh, currently, that is definitely not in the curbside system. Uh, and, and for the film part of it, trying to get those returned to retail um, and, and also really bolster the infrastructure to make sure that the return to retail uh, pathway is, is actually supported by the retail establishments. Uh, we're currently doing work in Seattle um, to they're pulling film out of their curbside program and going to be putting it into the um, uh, into the return to retail, we're, we're helping make sure that those, those retail establishments have it. Um, it we, we are also working, we announced a, a, a big report today called the Bridge to Circularity that discusses uh, we're going to be developing with other industry partners to find a pathway to recyclability for uh, items that are currently not captured by the system, uh, but that is we just made that announcement today. I don't want to say that we're doing it. We are, we are calling to other organizations like the Sustainable Packaging Coalition, like the Association of Plastic Recyclers, uh, to be able to support uh, research and infrastructure in investments. So, so those, those hard to recycle items like tubes or small format materials or film and flexibles to be able to get into the system in some, some path. Great. Well, thank you very much for uh, uh, calling in today and your presentation. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. And, um, and please, if, if there are any follow-up questions, I believe my contact information Mike has and, and reach out. And I'm sure to uh, be happy to follow up with anybody in the room. Nice. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And thank you for the opportunity to come to Vermont, which is always a pleasure to testify. 
Uh, my bio is on the last slide in my PowerPoint, but I want to give you a brief, brief introduction. My name is Chaz Miller. I have my own little recycling consulting firm. I've retired after 40 years plus in the business. Thanks. Uh, started in 1976 at the US EPA in their source separation program, which was the first attempt by the federal government to advocate recycling. Uh, worked at EPA for over a decade in both recycling and waste related issues, worked for the glass packaging industry as the director of recycling, and spent my last quarter of a century working for the National Waste and Recycling Association, working primarily on recycling issues, but not exclusively. And interestingly enough, I'm also the chairman of my home county's Aiming for Zero Waste Task Force. So living this issue every day as we try to increase the recycling rate in our county. Now, you know, during these hearings, you've heard a lot from many speakers about extending responsi ex producer responsibility for paper and packaging. And I want to make it clear that EPR has a place for some products. Sharps come to mind immediately. They're dangerous, they're generated several times a day by their users, and they have a very small number of producers. They are the perfect product for product stewardship. But the bigger question is what problem are we trying to resolve with an EPR program for paper and packaging? For Sharps, it's obvious. It's all about safety. What is it for paper and packaging? Are we simply trying to maximize recycling? Or are we trying to minimize environmental emissions and energy use? Now, these are the EPR goals. They're from Kathy Jamison's presentation a month ago. And I'd like to look at these a little bit more closely in terms of how they actually play out. Let's start with less toxic. Vermont was one of 19 states to pass the Toxics and Packaging Reduction Act. That law became de facto national law. The European Union liked it so much, they adopted it for all of Europe. And it outlawed the intentional introduction into packaging of lead, mercury, cadmium, and hexavalent chromium. That took care of toxics right there. It's an excellent law. What about product redesign? We're told time and time again that EPR will lead to product redesign. Well, the only problem is it doesn't. The Organization of Economic and uh, Cooperative Development, OECD, which is a big booster of EPR, has conceded there is no product redesign due to EPR. EPR Canada has conceded there is no EPR, there is no product design due to EPR. EPR began in Europe in 1991, and 20 years later they adopted the disruptor fees, with the idea that the disruptor fees would force some change, would force some packaging design because they had not seen it. And now the European companies are adopting eco-modulation fees to try to up the ante because EPR didn't, EPR failed, the disruptor fees failed, so now they gotta get a third time up at the plate to try it. But this is the fundamental problem. There are many costs that go in designing and making a package. And the EPR fee is one small little aspect of that. If you're making a package, you're looking at raw material costs, you're looking at manufacturing costs, you're looking at transportation costs. And you add those up, the EPR fee just does not have an impact. You know, from a company's perspective, essentially, EPR fees may be material as a whole on a, on a products company, but on an individual package, they are simply totally immaterial. And the companies also see the environmental benefits of lowering their raw material purchases, less extraction emissions, of lowering their manufacturing emissions, and most importantly, of lowering transportation costs and emissions. Yet this fundamental misunderstanding about packaging and costs is embedded in EPR. What about convenient collection opportunities? So to be honest, I, I'm, not, I'm a little perplexed by that goal. I was debating EPR two weeks ago in Toronto at the Canadian Waste and Recovery Conference. And my debating opponent at that conference talked about rationalizing recycling. And you heard a little bit of that from Alan Langdon's presentation. Well, when I hear the term rationalizing in case of a business, the first thing that comes to mind is somebody or somewhere is going to lose a job. And usually when a business gets rationalized, it's a lot of somebodies who lose their jobs, and it's businesses that go out of business. I, I know that there's a concern here in Vermont over protecting the two MRFs, totally understandable. But this is the question on that, that issue that you've got to keep in mind. 
The producer group will pay as little as possible to cover those collection and processing costs. They will not want to write a blank check. In the case of the program in British Columbia, the contracts they offered, all the MRFs, had a 60-day automatic cancellation uh, period if the PRO decided it wanted to exercise it. Now ask yourself if you're a MRF. Do you want to sign a contract and buy machinery and equipment if somebody can pull a plug on you with 60 days notice that comes out of the air? It's kind of a risky place to be, which is why a lot of the MRFs refuse to sign those contracts. Now, one other thought is that if EPR for paper and packaging is adopted by any of the other New England states, New York State, what is to prevent a producer organization from just saying, we've got a bigger MRF in the neighboring state, we're going to ship all the recyclables out of Vermont to be processed? Perfectly logical under the control, and you heard Alan Langdon talk about control, that a, MRF, that, that a PRO wants to have, because as far as they're concerned, once they pay that collection price, they own the recyclables. What about financial relief for municipalities and taxpayers? Well, that raises the obvious question, will taxes be lowered? Are you going to give financial relief to taxpayers, or do they get the joy of paying twice? Once as taxpayers, and once as consumers. Uh, EPR, by its very nature, is a regressive tax, just like a sales tax. It falls most heavily on lower income residents who have to spend a higher proportion of their income on non-discretionary purchases, including food that comes in packages or other consumer goods that comes in packages. Now let's look at some myths of EPR. Let's start off with the idea of producer groups and industry working together in harmony to solve the problem. That may well work for paint or thermostats. Those are industries with a very small number of producers. You can get them to work together, under the right antitrust protections, of course. But what about packaging? Well, the reality is, in British Columbia, you've got 1,200 stewards. You cannot get 1,200 stewards in one room at the same time to work out these problems. In Quebec, you have more than twice as many. So what happens is the producers simply write a check, and they leave it up to the staff and the consultants of the staff of that producer organization to actually figure out what they want to do and how they want to do it while they're writing the check. And another thing, EPR costs are not just the fee that an EPR program pays. Each, each producer has their own significant compliance costs that they have to cover as a part of that EPR program. They include, they include the cost of filling out the product reports. They include dealing with auditors from the producer group who quite bluntly the auditor's goal is simply to squeeze as much money as possible out of the producer so the group can have more money to play with. And then constant, constantly revising those reports as product lines and shipments change. Now, my presumption is Vermont would do like British Columbia and, and a lot of other places. You're going to look at the national uh, product distribution for a package and you're just going to all allocate Vermont's share by its percentage of the population. Well, that's all nice and good, but that means, say, a producer totally changes its products in Texas. Those changes may never see Vermont, but it's going to affect the money that comes into Vermont. And most importantly, I have never heard EPR proponents talk about those compliance costs and the impact they do. But I can tell you right now, Vermont businesses will notice them because they'll have to pay them. What about economies of scale? And, you know, we're told that a producer group rationalizes, so it creates economies of scale and allows a system of lower costs. Well, economies of scale are good. Why don't we just have one grocery chain in the state of Vermont or one gasoline station chain in the state of Vermont? Just think of the economies of scale you will get with that kind of monopoly. But there are a lot of reasons to think that kind of monopoly may not be a good idea. And in fact, in British Columbia, the, the, uh, the uh, Provincial Ministry of the Environment had an application from a group to compete with what is now Recycle British Columbia, and they rejected that application for a number of reasons, one of which, quite frankly, was RBC was too big to fail. It's putting a lot of eggs into one basket. There's the myth that producers pay for recycling. They pay the full cost of recycling. Well, this is the reality. The producer group pays what it thinks is a reasonable cost for collection and processing, a reasonable cost based on the analysis of their consultants and their staff. 
British Columbia claims to play, cover the full cost of recycling, yet the re incentive fee, they call it an incentive fee, that they pay to the communities. That incentive fee is based on what they think the cost should be, and it generally, in many cases, simply does not cover a community's costs. To the point that now the communities in BC have absolutely demanded transparency in how that fee is set because they want more money. They want to cover all their costs. And interestingly enough, the fee was so low that the city of Vancouver simply got out of the recycling business. They turned it all over to Recycle British Columbia. Now, in Quebec, Echo Enterprise, I think, is much more honest when it, when it simply says that they're responsible for the efficient and effective cost of recycling. They don't claim to be responsible for all of it. But at the same time, they decide which is efficient and effective. And remember, as, as I said earlier, and you heard it from Mr. Langdon, under APR, the producers own the recyclables at the point of collection. They want full control of the system and its cost. They will not write a blank check for costs they cannot confirm or control. The idea of producers internalizing costs, the, the, really the spark plug reason for the, the original APR programs. But do they internalize it, or is it just a pass-through? Something the consumer never knows, knows about. I mean, to Vermont businesses, this is just another cost of doing business in this state. It's accompanied by the additional compliance costs that I mentioned. It's a hidden cost they'll pass on to their consumers who will have no idea they just paid for recycling. And yet, the paint, the mattress, the carpet companies, and their repair programs, they are adamant that there be a shown fee so that the buyer knows that there is a cost to recycling and that they have a stake in successful recycling. And is EPR good for the environment? Are we talking about design for recycling or are we talking about design for the environment and sustainable materials management? Now, several speakers at previous hearings have tried hard to square the circle. They want to encourage recycling to the maximum extent possible while also encouraging that the environmental benefits are maximized to that maximum extent possible. But you can't do that in every case, in a lot of cases. You know, recycling rightly follows waste reduction and reuse on the hierarchies for waste and materials management. Recycling is a manufacturing process. Recycling destroys in order to create, in order to create whether it's shredding, whether it's crushing, whether it's grinding, whether it's smelting and, and melting down, recycling is an inherently destructive problem, product, excuse me, process that does lead to a new product, but in that process, materials are lost and emissions are created. I love recycling, it does a lot of great work, but we have to be upfront about what recycling really accomplishes and how. And you know, virtually all greenhouse gases related to consumption, because what we have in this country, and in North America, this is what I said in Canada two weeks ago, we don't have a waste problem. We have excellent waste management systems. We have a consumption problem. <laughs> and it's consumption we should be focusing on. And yet, if you look at the greenhouse gases caused by our consumption problem, 98, 99% are caused by material extraction, manufacturing, and transportation. Only one or two percent by disposal. And yet EPR penalizes waste reduction with its emphasis on higher fees for non-recyclable products, even if those products are greener than the recyclable competitors. That's a real paradox. I've been doing recycling for so long, I really had to struggle to wrap my little pea brain about this one. But the data is irrefutable. This is EPA and the environmental impacts of coffee packaging choices. The 100%, if you will, recyclable steel can, the rigid plastic container, and the flexible pouch. The data is very clear. Flexible pouch, which can't be recycled. Everything goes to disposal. Lowest greenhouse gas emissions from cradle to grave. Lowest energy use. It even takes up less landfill space than its recyclable competitors. Yet, why are we punishing it because it can't be recycled? Why, why are we doing this? To me, that makes absolutely no sense. You know, do you really want to have more diesel-powered semi-trucks driving down Vermont's roads 
so they can, they can deliver heavier, more recyclable products? I don't think that's progress. I certainly would not have wanted it in my home state of Maryland where I live now. I want to make one thing clear. Recycling does a great deal of good. It is absolutely necessary, but it is not the end. It's a way to get there. It's a tool, but it is not the end result. You know, the environment and the universe do not revolve around recycling. They revolve around ways to use less and less raw materials and create lower and lower emissions. That is what we want, and that's what we should try to achieve. So, everybody's favorite words from the speaker. In conclusion, <laughs> packaging is a particularly complicated area when it comes to EPR. Behavior change is absolutely crucial to recycling. Yet extended producer responsibility does not change packages, nor does it change individual recycling behavior. It creates a monopoly that is now responsible for collection and processing of traditional recyclables. And you know, one thing you've really got to think through very carefully, what is the goal? What do you want to accomplish here? Because beware of what you wish for. You may get something quite unexpected. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, any committee questions? Okay. Hey. Hey. Um, so I'm glad you brought up the flexible pouch uh, scenario. It's something we've talked about as a group, and I think the focus that we've mentioned as a group is um, wanting to address how single-use products add to the waste problem in Vermont, and recycling is part of the solution, I think, as you mentioned. Um, and we have mentioned EPR as a way to drive um, both uh, reducing the number of single-use products that are entering the waste stream, but also making those products and packaging better for the waste stream, whether it be recyclable or, you know, if a, a flex-use package. Um, if EPR isn't the way to push or can, uh, persuade producers to create packaging that helps reduce our waste stream, then what is? Well, I, I think in the first place, for EPR to be an effective cost signal to a producer, the fees going to be, have to be significantly higher. And what that may well mean when it comes to those flexible packaging, when that fee hits and it is significantly higher, you may find yourself dealing with irate consumers who are furious over the cost increases to the packages they use on a daily basis and don't understand why the cost increases are that way. Because again, EPR sends such a small, small, small price signal to a company. They're looking at a much bigger cost array. And frankly, if you're into sustainability, you care far more about reducing your overall impact than you do about the number of packages you produce or how recyclable you are. You're looking at that overall environmental goal. So, and, and what is, it, what is a single-use product? I, I saw the definition of the law on its face that's pretty vague. Newspaper's a single-use product. Magazine, probably. Clearly single-use, but my refillable jug is full of cold brewed coffee and I really don't need any more. <laughs> uh, yet the work done by the state of Oregon showed very clearly that reusable has the best impact. Why, why do you put tap water in a plastic bottle when you can put it into a refillable container? I mean, come on. To me, it doesn't make any sense. And the other hand, in a national emergency, everybody loves plastic bottles for water because they fill an immediate need. Uh, there will always be single-use products that will be excluded from this law. One is anything health-related. I had the misfortune to have something called cellulitis in June. Uh, don't get it. It involves either a staph or a strep uh, getting into your system through an open wound. It's not fun. And as I was sitting on that table at the emergency room, seeing the, with the IV pumping the, the, uh, the antibiotics into me, I just thought to myself, you know, I'm so happy with the sharp, that the tube and the transporter uh, device all came in sterilized individual packages. I didn't want somebody just pulling them out of a bin and saying, here, let's use this one, it looks okay. So there will always be exceptions to that. And I think you may be trying to accomplish too much. I have a question on the, uh, we've heard a little bit before about the coffee packaging um, 
data that you were sharing, but th I hadn't seen it all, so thank you for bringing that. Um, is this representative? I mean, I'm just wondering if it serves as a representative example of many packaging situations, or it's uh, unusual and at least makes us ask a question. I think that's a great question, and the answer is it's, 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 it's most representative for the products that it examined, which in this case had to be those three. You can do other LCAs for different products that will have a different type of potential packaging, mm -hmm. because in this case, you know, flexible packaging is simply not available for all products. And in those cases, you're probably going to get different results. I, 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 if I might add one other thing, this was done by EPA, so I, I totally trust the conclusions. <laughs> On um, product redesign, uh, you were saying, I mean, the, the point listed was no product redesign. And I think in part we're looking at some of this work here as kind of a stitch in time saves nine. How can we help the entire system think ahead so there's less of a problem to manage downstream? Um, do you not see, what are the, are there no opportunities in taking that sort of frame of mind and bringing it to this work? Well, first of all, you're asking about predicting the future, the future of packaging. When I started at EPA in 76, do you want to know what everybody was complaining about for recycling? It was ground wood computer printout paper. Now, who here remembers printout paper, much less ground wood printout paper? Times change, the materials we use change. I don't know how to predict 10 years down the road. I don't know how to predict what the new products are going to be, what the new materials are going to be. And I think that's one fundamental problem that we're all struggling with in these programs. Um, in terms of, um, we've also looked at post-consumer waste requirements as part of packaging as a way of um, creating demand for a product that can end up accumulating and becoming problematic, so you can create demand for that product and fold it back into new packaging. Is that a way to drive product redesign? When I was at, started at NSWMA, Congress was taking its first real look at packaging and recycling. And in 1994, as an association, we were the only private sector trade association to endorse post-consumer minimum re uh, content requirements for newspapers. And we were adamant about that because at the time, newspaper is the biggest thing you collected and we desperately need markets. Now, actually, as it turned out, the industry had made an enormous event, investments in the use of secondary content in newsprint. That problem went away, as unfortunately over time did newspapers. But it was, it, we had great markets for the latter half of the 90s and, and, and about, to about 2010 or so. I think when it comes to post-consumer content requirements, and I have no problem with them whatsoever, You've got to figure out a couple of things. First of all, is it simply shifting the markets? For instance, if you require post-consumer for, a, say, a PET bottle, will that simply shift the market away from fiber to that PET bottle, or will expand the market? Personally, I'm not interested in anything that simply shifts the market. I'm interested in something that expands the market. And secondly, it's a real big mystery about this. What is the loss rate in PET and HDP and other plastics recycling. You can figure out, I mean, everybody knows the loss rate for paper. It's seven times and then the fiber is shot. Loss rate for glass, I know from my own experience, is somewhere around 10 to 20 percent of the glass that goes in, let's call it, gets lost to the, to the, the, smelting, the melting process. I know offhand what the numbers are for plastic, and, or I'm sorry, for steel and for aluminum. Nobody knows what the loss rates are for PET and HDP, or if they know they're not talking. But it's a mechanical process, it creates fines, things get lost. It, that's a good piece of information to know, because until you know that number, it's harder to know how effective the post-consumer requirements will be. But hey, I'm all for them, if they can expand markets. Um, and then the last quick question is, I think you, I didn't quite catch the name of it, you said you're, Heading sort of a work group back in your home uh, community, like a zero waste. Yes. Group. So what's what's the if you uh, gave us a, a short version of what you're aiming for there? Does any of it apply to our packaging totally. conversation here? Yes and no. Uh, our charge from our county executive, and there are seven of us, is very direct and simple. He wants us to eliminate this to, to increase recycling and recovery to an extent that. Essentially, 
we send as little as possible to disposing. And he's, he's told us exactly what his goals are at county politics. Don't need to get it in now. But this is the problem. Essentially, it, it would mean that we, we at least, we, we're 41% recycling now and recovery. Yard waste and, and a very strong dual stream program in the county. Uh, we would have to go up to about 60 to 70% to meet his goal. We voted unanimously to continue doing dual stream. I think people either consciously or subconsciously knew that we were trading off quantity for quality, but it was a unanimous vote. We want to stay with dual stream. It's all about food waste in my county. It's all about how do we really increase the food waste because we do virtually nothing in the county. So that is what we're focused on. And we did benchmark. We benchmarked our county against Austin, um, Austin, Minneapolis, Toronto, King County, Washington, and San Francisco. And what we discovered from that benchmark is, first of all, we only found one, maybe two, that actually got to 50% recovery slash recycling. San Francisco, by the way, was not one of those. The real recycling rate is 49%. Forget what they tell you in the press. The real number is 49%. It was King County, Wisconsin, or I'm sorry, King County, Washington was almost at 60%, but like Seattle, they can never quite make it to 60. They've done incredibly good work over the last three decades. They've been very patient, very steady, slowly rolled, rolled out their, their programs but they still cannot get above 60%. And that's really informed our thinking because we're wondering, what is that realistic goal? And where do you get to the point where you simply run out of recovery options because people are people or whatever, that, that you're just, you're running into, the, in, into reality, if you will. Aaron. So to build on that, you, you commented a couple times about behavior change. Um, we all know that consumer behavior needs to change. Have you found practices that have worked to change consumer? Are there, is there information out there that shows progress based on changing consumer behavior? We know the curbside works very, very well because everybody sees what their neighbors are doing. I can go down and walk my dog Thursday morning in my neighborhood, and I know that everybody is out there recycling because that's what everybody does. You don't have that in apartment buildings, you don't have it in public spaces. And we know that we just have not made that cultural shift. So the behavior change occurs in anonymity, not just in broad daylight. That's the problem. Are there incentives, though, that you're considering or that you've talked about? No, but if we come up with some, I'll tell you, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, I'm sorry, Catherine. Um, so, um, with our work group, I think three of the main issues that we're trying to address is you know, we have a significant amount of our landfill capacity. A third of our MSW are single-use products. About half of that third could be recycled um, if it were put in the right bin. Um, our recycling costs, just like the rest of the county, uh, country, have, have soared, and we're really struggling with markets. You know the story there. If you put any more material in our recycling system, I and mean, people are already debating on whether or not they should continue recycling. So that, that's a stressed system. And we are um, hearing about the negative environmental and human health impacts from single-use products and packaging. And while we address some of the, the heavy metals, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, we're concerned with PFAS and other emerging contaminants of concern. So those three big topics are what we're trying to explore. And EPR was one of the tools we were looking at for that. Not necessarily to solve all the ills of our system, but to help with that, that cost that's going on. And if there are, you know, many manufacturers are looking at making more materials recyclable, we need to do something for the system. And asking taxpayers to pay more right now isn't um, one of the better options for us. So what would be your recommendation to solve those issues? Well, in the first place, you may be overreaching on what you're trying, the goals you're trying to hit. That, that's the first one. In the, the, the testimony you had in the hearing a month ago, you talked about the mandated recyclables. You're getting 72% recovery. Uh, the question I would have is, what is the overlap between the universe of single-use packages and the mandated recyclables? So what is the potential extra recovery you're going to get out of that? Because 72% is a very good rate for mandated recyclables. Suggest that what we 
are required to put in a blue bin. Absolutely not understood. But manufacturers, as you know, are creating more and more of these materials and different kinds of materials that can't go through our recycling system right now. And I don't think that's going to change. I mean, there's two demographic trends you've got to keep in mind. One is the fact that there are twice as many Americans living in single-person households today as there were 20 years ago. What does that translate to? It translates to small packages to avoid food waste. And the other one, ironically enough, is there are more people eating by themselves, even married couples. And that too translates into, into smaller packages to avoid food waste. I don't know how any government can control or change those kinds of changes. Because right there what you have are companies who make food, who make food products and sell them in the market. They don't want that food to go bad because they had it in a big package that's too big for the user. But if you said and, and you may be asking for too much. Yeah, you said the fees are probably immaterial to manufacturers for EPR. And if that's the case, and if that would help with our recycling system, why not go ahead with that? But will it help with your recycling system? That becomes well, the next question. Well, it help with the finances of it. And right now, we're, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a need of financial help. In that case, I think you have to be very, very upfront with the residents and the taxpayers of Vermont and saying you get to pay twice now. You get to pay with your taxes, and you get to pay as a consumer. And I've never seen that happen in the EPR format where people were told you got to pay twice. Congratulations. But if the cost of recycling was paid for by an EPR program, why would it continue to have to be paid for by the taxes? Well, I have yet to see in Europe or in Canada an EPR program that cut tax, a, a local government that cut taxes because it now had an EPR program picking up its recyclables. So cons taxpayers will still pay that. They'll still pay those taxes. And now they get to pay for EPR as consumers. That's an extra, that's an extra 98 million Canadian in British Columbia that they get to pay. So again, if you want to do it, just I think you have to be straightforward with residents that now your taxes will not go down, and by the way, you're paying as consumers. I have a question. Yes, please. And, and it's interesting to me because I know in Montgomery County, Maryland, where I grew up and my family still lives, you can dispose of up to 500 pounds of trash for no fee because of the incinerator in Hagerstown. So <laughs> I'm thinking that uh, pay to throw has something to do with this here. But my question for you is, can you imagine an EPR system that might cover um, or have a sliding scale structure, fee structure, that is not based on the recyclability of a product, but rather its overall carbon footprint or life cycle analysis, because that's really what we're pushing for here. Uh, yeah, one minor correction, Montgomery County, the 500 pounds is only at the transfer station. They watch that like a hawk. I know, my brothers and abuse it all the time. <laughs> I mean, I think most of that stuff is a C&D, or it's furniture, it's heavy stuff. You don't, you don't see people doing garbage like that at the station. Um, and frankly, I think it's dumb on the county's part. We'd love to see pay you throw on the county. we got some legal issues that I think we can overcome over time. Uh, I think it would be great. If you can come up with a way to do that on environmental impact, go for it. I just haven't seen anybody do it that way. Sure. Always the first time. Yep, but somebody has to figure out how to do it. Correct. Well, thank you very much for coming in. Obviously, people have questions, and you'll maybe get some more <laughs> after the break or after. So, uh, good afternoon. Yeah, for the record. Uh, thank you for uh, coming in today to talk to us about uh, well, the topic at hand, single-use products. And uh, uh, so uh, the floor is yours. We've actually, I know you're reviewing a number of different things. We scheduled a half hour, up to half an hour, so please lead off. Okay, well thank you all for inviting us to speak. Um, it's very exciting to be part, you know, being given testimony here, you've just passed one of the country's most progressive plastic, um, single-use plastic bills, um, and it's great that you're carrying with that momentum. So I'm Sarah Edwards, and I work for a company called Unomia Research and Consulting. So we're a very mission-driven environmental consultancy that's been going around for about 20 years, and this is my um, colleague, Dimitri Shek. So, 
Unobia actually does mean the goddess of good governance. And I think that's at the ethos of, of our company as, as a whole. Um, and how we do that effectively is working through a number of different areas. So we have teams within our organisation. We have over 100 consultants that work across predominantly waste and resource management, but everything from advising on policy through really the integrity of how systems work on grass resource level. So we understand both how um, producers, legislators, and those organisations that implement these programmes um, are affected by policy effectively. And we did that through a number of offices across here. So we're going to talk to you about a number of different kind of bringing together experience, I suppose, of our company from across the globe. Um, we are both based in New York City. Um, and this, I suppose, gives you a little bit of an overview of the type of work that we do on single use packaging. Um, and EPDR as a whole. So we have recently just finished looking at a piece for Ontario about how their um, currently 50% uh, funded EPR model um, will transition to a full EPR model with the addition of a, a deposit system for non alcoholic beverages. That one of their goals is to reach over 75%, and uh, currently they have, they're hovering around 64%. So our work was basically doing a cost-benefit analysis of how they could reach that 75%, and that included the introduction of the deposit system for non-alcoholic containers, because they already have one for alcoholic containers. At the moment, we're advising um, the uh, uh, Alberta Urban Municipality Authority on how they can design an EPR um, policy pack for packaging and printed paper. So part of that we've been reviewing the systems in Ontario, the systems in British Columbia that you've heard about, as well as the systems in Europe. Um, and on the other side, we've just finished working, for instance, with the European Commission on its single-use plastics directive. So we effectively advise the Commission on which 10 items should be, um, um, should either be subject to a ban or a target or a phasing out. So, and we do that through economic analysis and review of different policy measures. Um, and then on top of that, we've done a significant amount of work on deposits as a whole. So we've developed a kind of blueprint for deposits in, um, uh, in the US and how that could be implemented in kind of virgin states, those states that don't currently have a deposit system. And also, we've, at the moment, we've just finished doing some review of the California system that's going through some problems as well, looking at their legislation and how that may change um, to address their problems. So I think Kathy has already really touched on a lot of the challenges that you're facing, so I'm not kind of going to kind of go over this again. Um, but you know, that there's things around with marine plastics, there's producers making some commitments in terms of what they should be doing as brands, whether that's in terms of minimum cycle content or um, you know, um, using alternative materials. And so there's a number of, like, obviously, system changes, which is why so many states at the moment are looking at EPR and seeing how it can, can, um, can benefit them, I suppose, as a state. Um, and we've also touched on the circular economy side of things. So I think it's important to, to touch on that, you know, what we want to try and do is, as, as in line with the waste hierarchy and policy, not to, prevent, to produce this package in the first place. But when we do produce that package, then it can stay in circulation for, for as long as possible. And that includes a number of different things that, that you know, we've touched on, in looking at the design of a product and how that, how, how that can be um, recycled when it gets into, into the market through to the, the on-the-ground recycling systems that are in place to collect those materials. So packaging in itself isn't a bad thing as long as it's captured, as long as we've got the right systems in place to make sure that we can capture that material. And obviously we're going to talk a little bit about that. But in order to create the circular economy, the most important thing is quality of material. This comes back to what we've talked about recycling a lot today. But what is the definition of recycling? Is it is what is it what a resident puts out in there, you know, every week for collection? Is it what goes to the materials recycling facility? Is it, is it even what comes out of the back of the material recycling facility? Well, actually, no. Every step of that way, there's contamination in that material, and actually, it's only the material that actually makes it into a product that really the circular economy is, 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 is concerned about. So it's about how we create a system that cr creates that quality to allow all that, that material to stay in circulation as long as possible. And then we have to look at, okay, what policy measures can allow us to do that? That's a quick question. Uh, so um, the presumption there is you already have that product. Do you deal with sort of before we ever get to that stage, the reduce uh, and reuse piece as well, so that what flows into this part of the system is uh, as small as possible? Yeah, and I think there's obviously, um, there's different policy measures, things like the right to repair legislation, for instance, that's um, there to allow, you know, 
remanufacturers or repairers to, 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 to have the information they need to repair a good at, you know, at the end of its life. But ultimately, I mean, we've talked about can EPR uh, change packaging, packaging design. Uh, our view is it can change packaging design. And the piece of work we're currently doing now for the European Commission is writing some guidance for all 28 member states as to how they could implement a modulated fee. I mean, I don't want to go into the details of that too much because I actually don't think that's the role of, 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 of policy makers. My view in terms of EPR is that you should, guys should be setting very high targets. So you should be saying that I want 70% of the packaging that's placed on the market to be recycled, okay? Ultimately, that will do, drive the be they, 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 they can either get to the 70% and then you hopefully you can stretch those targets, or they don't put packaging on the market that can't be recycled because they're going to miss those targets. So you're not stipulating to them how they design their product. You're not even stipulating to them whether they internally have a fee to pay between the producers themselves. All you're saying is my desired outcome from this is ultimately to have a only material that's placed on the market that can be captured, in, is captured, and you've invested in the infrastructure to allow it to be captured and therefore recycled. So I think we've talked a lot about the, the nuances of, of a design of an EPR system, but really, uh, as legislators, that's not really your role. Your role is to set the outcome-based targets that you want to, to be achieved. And within those outcome-based targets, you, need, you can include for the producers to, to incentivize their members to, only, to, to, to look at the waste hierarchy and for those members to be rewarded if they're putting a product on the market that can be reused. You know, I mean, yeah, so there's, you know, we've talked a little bit about innovation. You know, you can see the likes of Uber Eats, for instance, asking all their members to use reusable containers in the future. This isn't, this isn't that far away, you know, this is actually something that's conceivable. And it, I think you shouldn't be, I think you should be bold in terms of what you're thinking about because the juice are being bold. If you look at what PepsiCo is doing at the moment, I mean, they're moving to having barcodes on your, to your bottles and you'll go to a, effectively like a soda siphon, you'll scan your bottle, you'll have an account, you'll fill up with whatever drink you want, you'll have an account, and that's how you're going to purchase your drink in the future. You know, we're doing some work for the um, European um, bottle manufacturers and they're looking at what the cost is to have an individual code on every single product they put on the market because actually they want to know what's happening to their product at the end of its life. They don't want to see it out on a beach. They want to make sure that that material is captured. And the cost of those systems through things like blockchain is coming down significantly. So I don't think you should worry too much about you know, asking for something that's not achievable because these things are achievable and we're seeing those things happening at the moment. Um, so I digress slightly, probably. <laughs> but um, so in terms of what we look at, and I think you've obviously touched on some of these things. You know, you've implemented bans. There's taxes. We've talked a little bit about extended producer responsibilities, and those mandatory, enforceable targets, are in in essence, are what drives um, extended producer responsibility. And the incentive side of things comes from potentially the mechanisms within the design of the EPR system, where producers are incentivised to not put a packaging on the market that isn't recyclable or, put, or incentivised to put packaging material on the market that is durable or reusable or hasn't got PFASs in it. It's an internal design mechanism, an internal incentive mechanism that can come through it with a well-designed EPR um, system. So these are kind of all mechanisms, I say policy mechanisms that you can look at. Um, Sorry to interrupt, can I ask another quick question? Yeah. So you know, a lot of our discussion has been um, what is it, handling the physical container, who, who gets it, where, when, how, how is it managed. Um, are there systems that are also um, looking at public health risks associated with plastics and toxicity and building uh, those impacts, those public health impacts, into uh, the policy in order to drive us to less toxic packaging? Um, I don't know of any in terms of packaging, in terms of toxic packaging. I mean, I think you could um, say that the changes in the um, Waste Framework Directive in Europe, which is actually requiring producers to not only pay for the recycling of their packaging, but they have to pay for the littering of their, their packaging as well, which obviously has, has kind of amenity, public amenity, public health, and ultimately, potentially, if that material, you know, plastic ends up in the sea, a co an unknown cost 
that we, we just don't know yet. So there's one, that is one way in terms of producers are having to pick up that additional cost. And you know, in terms of EPR, we say, well, our view is that EPR shouldn't just cover the, the packaging that is actually collected for recycling. It should cover the packaging that ends up in the disposal of in a landfill site or incinerator. If there's supposed to be control of your packaging, you should be doing everything you can to make sure that you're covering both the cost of it going to landfill and the cost of it needing to be recycled. And that's going to, when you have potentially got an area that's got higher landfill fees, you know, they're going to have to make their decision then as to how they invest in infrastructure to, to divert that material. But ultimately, it's coming back to the targets. Um, and then obviously on the, on the same side, we're now starting to look at um, uh, like different policy makers, you know, uh, voluntary organisations are making their own voluntary com commitments. And we've done work in the past looking at how effective voluntary, voluntary commitments are by industry, and they're quite frankly not. <laughs> so I think this is the best time to capitalise on these commitments and legislate for some of the things that they're saying they're able to do anyway. Um, and, um, and it's how we kind of you do that through, through the policy side. Um, so we have just obviously talked about um, uh, extended producer responsibility, and I think um, it, 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 we talked a little bit earlier about it does it you know does it create design change. And I think that's a very, it, it, it effectively, if you set the targets high enough, then there's going to be effectively a, a cost decision to be made by producers. Do they put a product in the market that's going to, they're going to not be able to meet their targets and they're going to have to pay a penalty for not meeting that target, but maybe that penalty is less than having to change their packaging material. Or are they going to change their packaging material to meet those targets? Um, and, and ultimately, um, I mean, the cost isn't going to be a double whammy, I don't think, for your residents because they pay for their um, waste, you know, as, as an individual household rather than through a tax anyway. So there's not going to be this double taxation. Ultimately, what you want producers to do for EPR is, is internalise the externality. So why, as a householder, why, as a, um, as a state, as a municipality, should you be trying to manage a product that you have no control over? You know, you don't know what packaging is coming on the market, and you don't know the impact of that packaging. Whereas a producer can un can look at what is the cost to, to doing business of putting that packaging on the market, and if they choose to still put that packaging on the market because that's a business sense for them to do, that's then fine. That's you know that's their decision to make. Um, and I think you know globally, the, the EU has had uh, EPR for a long time. The legislation's recently become more, much more stringent in terms of what those targets are, um, and each member state, you know employs that in a different in a different way. And I think, you know, most importantly on the EPR point before I hand over to Sydney to talk a little bit more about the EPR programme that you already have, um, is that bottle bills are an EPR programme. Who you know, who is paying for the bottle bill in Vermont? It is producers, especially because the unredeemed deposits <laughs> go predominantly back to, to the state. So this is an EPR programme in operation um, and it is achieving seventy five percent redemption rates um, and it is achieving the quality material that producers need to feed into that circular economy and to meet those minimum recycle content goals and I think that's very important. Yeah, so now we'll pivot a little bit to talk about the bottle bill, um, which we heard about a lot earlier um, this afternoon. And so Vermont's bottle bill was instituted in 1972. There have been a couple small updates since <laughs> um, but a lot of the bill is still in place. It's not especially progressive when compared to some best practices across the globe and even across the country. And we know Vermont is seen as an environmental leader in a lot of ways, um, but the bottle bill has yet to sort of catch up in many of those instances. For instance, the deposit value has not been raised since the inception. So five cents back in 1972 is worth a lot more than five cents now. So it's not necessarily creating the incentive that it did when it was first thought up. Um, so that's something that could be addressed. Also, like we some others mentioned, the scope. Um, there's drinks now that they didn't conceive of at the time of um, drafting. And so some drinks that pretty much should be included or not. Why are we penalizing some producers by having their products included and not others? It's basically an inequitable system at this point in time that should be remedy, as well as being very confusing for consumers who you know, have a soda and then have a juice and they're not treated equally. 
Um, so there are best practices, and the best practice bills regularly achieve 90% redemption. And so we don't think that's a stretch to assume that Vermont could get there um, with just a few updates. And so the current, the scope of the current program covers by, by units approximately 50% of the, the units put on the market, but by weight, um, it's about 54%. And you can see here that the wine and cider, which is only 3% by unit of the beverage containers put on the market, is 23% by weight. So currently, as others mentioned, glass, which makes up the, the majority of that program um, of those beverages, is very costly to deal with and transport and not so profitable when you go to market that material. So definitely something to consider when deciding you know, how to increase the scope or whether to increase the scope, why you know, go with what has been in place for over 40 years when so much else has changed. And then the, the bottles that aren't recycled through the deposits, only approximately 30% of those containers that don't go through the bottle bill are recycled. And then Vermonters are left paying for the containers that are littered or landfilled um, through their, the landfill fees. And there are approximately 25,000 tons currently that are eligible. Um, under the bottle bill, and this would increase almost 50% to about 44 tons with um, modernization to basically include all beverages aside from dairy and wellness, which are often excluded um, in this country and in many parts across the world. And so this has been covered somewhat at length already today. Um, there's some, obviously going to be some impact, some transition with the, a modernization of the bottle bill. And as um, Alan said earlier, you know, the ownership of bottle bill material would transfer from municipalities essentially to the producers, but this also insulates them from material risk under EPR. Uh, yeah, and if, if we transition to EPR. And so that would insulate them from the market fluctuations, which have been such an issue lately with the China policy and as others in Southeast Asia sort of follow suit. And um, yeah, so there will be a movement of the material if you expand the scope from the curbside recycling bin to the bottle bill, but also from the trash. You know, it's not just bottles that people recycle that then they'll begin to take to the bottle depots will also be the bottles that do end up in the trash stream you know are now seen as commodities and so those that would be actual garbage would then be taken out and be further recycled and it should be mentioned that the bottle bill is the only program really that targets non-residential waste as well it doesn't differentiate between bottles that are sold in commercial establishments versus those that are meant to take home. So really, it democratizes the whole process um, for all the bottles sold on the market. So we put together um, a little bit of an analysis of two options for modernization that Vermont could undertake. One would be just a scope expansion, so including all of those um, beverages currently not covered, excluding dairy and wellness. Um, and the second option would be expanding the scope to include all of those, as well as increasing the deposit value to 10 cents, which would be in line with Michigan and Oregon in this country right now. And with that increase, we would say that that would get the redemption rate from 75% to 85% pretty quickly, as the redemption rate in Oregon following that transition happened within really a period of about six months. So here's just a little graph of um, the impacts from option one. So this is with 202 million additional units redeemed, um, going to that 85% redemption rate. And um, then you can see here, there will be a loss in the material revenue from those materials that would go through the curbside recycling bin today but there would also be savings from avoided landfill costs from those that are moving out of the trash stream. 
Um, and then there's also the value of additional materials captured. So when you look at the system overall, really there's a net, um, a net financial gain um, to be had in terms of savings and additional revenue when you're looking at this expansion. Question. Yes. Do we have any data from other other um, jurisdictions on the sheets when when um, when this has grown? So, I mean, effectively, the second option. I mean, obviously, the sheets will go down if you if you put the deposit up as well shortly after. So, Oregon. I mean, Oregon the sheets doesn't go back. But if you put the, you know, if you're effectively going to cover any loss in the sheets by putting the deposit up to ten cents. Because effectively you're doubling the deposit, you're doubling the value of the sheet, the sheet, the number of units that uh, you know you have in a sheet attributed goes down, but the value of that single unit goes up. So effectively you're getting more money into the system. We did an analysis actually for New York City. Oh, do we have it? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, also, to me, I'm thinking if we're covering a lot more containers, yeah. mm -hmm. then, then there's a lot more opportunity for sheets, if you will, even though the, the cost per unit went up. Exactly, so you're only covering 52% of containers at the moment, so you could go up to um, 2% of the wellness, I don't think it's mm -hmm. So you go up to like covering 98%, so you've almost doubled the number of units that you've got right. that you can capture from, so even if you don't get any change in redemption rate, your sheets are going to go up. Okay. If you put the deposit on, you're going to get less, more, more return, so you get higher, more value through the system in terms of material quality, but your value will still be there. Yeah. Thank you. On the third bar over, uh, value of additional material captured, so is that, a ref well, can you explain that? I'm just wondering, I know that now we talk about um, fair amount of glass that's going through the non-sort stream, the zero-sort stream, ends up um, as a, a low-quality glass. And so are you saying by going the bottle bill channel that now it becomes a higher quality product and it has an incremental increased value as a, a waste material? Yeah, so that's essentially for the additional volume and also for that additional material value that you get from the, the materials moving from the curbside to the deposits. And we have information on sort of the difference in the material prices that you can get um, for each different material. And it's, an, you know, PET, you can get 40% more um, per ton in terms of prices when you're selling deposit material versus curbside material just due to the much better quality this, it's cleaner, it's better, you know, separated, and um, it can basically be made into higher quality products. You're not going to ever have a plastic bottle from a single stream system that's able to be made into a new plastic bottle. But from a deposit system, those, those sorts of things are possible. So it's, yeah, definitely a, a higher value commodity. Thank you. And so this is um, the same analysis for option two. And you can see here, we did sort of have this little disclaimer that um, although fewer, con fewer containers are left on the beam to be 10 cent deposit more than compensates for the volume loss. So you can see sort of this same kind of comparison, um, pretty similar breakdown with 229 million additional units redeemed. Um, so we can go into this in more detail or let you digest the data, sure. Just, and you don't have to answer this, but just think about um, in Vermont we have specific waste composition study data, mm -hmm. and we had a recent uh, from 2018. So was that used to look at how much is actually being disposed? Because you can't assume all that's being disposed. Yes. Yeah. Um, we used you your waste okay. composition awesome. data. Awesome. Yeah. And I think it was, um, was it 2018. Then? We did this analysis a couple months ago, so it may have been the 2015. Um, yeah. But, but at least you, you used the one. Yeah, yeah, we used then, Vermont's perspective. And then second, um, you, um, Mr. Putin testified earlier that um, there's a handling fee per unit container. That's a cost of the system that's yeah. different from the cost of our recycling. Was that included in this analysis, the handling fee? No, I mean, we haven't looked at the cost of the system to produce it. Well, mm -hmm. that, 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 yeah, that, that handling fee often gets passed on to the consumer. So it, you know, so it might not be a net increase that much if you 
included the handling fee. Just something to consider. Yeah, I mean, I think the handling fee, I mean, it's on a product now, is it? I mean, it's, at the moment, it's just unfairly on some products and not on other products. You know, it's not treating every beverage equally. Um, and so, you know, if I buy a kind of fizzy Coke, then I'm paying it, but if, I'm, I'm not, if I buy a bottle of water, that doesn't seem very fair. Ultimately, each beverage should be treated equally. Um, yeah, I'm just saying in the cost analysis as far as how much you would benefit financially, there is that cost if it goes to redemption that should be considered. The cost on the paying the redemption centers for the work that they do. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. But this is really only looking at material value. It wasn't looking at, you know, the cost of operating the system. Oh. This is, so this is like the material value element of it. What happens when you move material from one system to another system? I mean, there's additional benefits on here that you could, we would generally model a system where we say, okay, so you're taking this much tonnage out of your residual waste stream or your trash waste stream. How can your, how can your collection system be optimised? You know, you're, you're, okay, you're reducing this amount of, amount of tonnage through your MRF um, facility. You're taking glass out. What, what are the savings on your processing fees from not having to handle glass? You know, they, so there's a lot more in terms of total system cost on this. And I think some of you might have seen the report we did for Ontario, which looked at each, each of those individual costs. But that's a hundred page report. Or more than that. <laughs> so it's really heavy reading. <laughs> um, but yeah, ultimately, there's other system benefits that aren't even included in here. This is just purely about material going from one place to another place. Okay, thank you. Can I, just, yeah. I think what you're saying is. Yes, there are maybe material system benefits, but there are also other costs that we need to take into consideration. Um, it, it costs producers and distributors and retailers time and money to uh, to provide those benefits, and I think that we need to have an understanding of what what that impact is as well. I think that's what you were saying. Yes, there are other costs that right. need to. Yeah, it's not the bottom line. That's not the bottom line. No, this is about this is just about material maintenance. As well as the impact to a MRF for the loss of that material. Yes, yeah, so it needs to be well understood because that is going to have an impact on a recycling facility. Yeah, so ultimately, what will happen? What will happen at the MRF? Then, if you if material is, take, is taken out, where what will happen to to to, to you? To you? Well, we have less valuable material going in. Yeah, so, so you're going to have stuck to cut the paper your, and we're picking it up the curbside. You have your mandatory recycling. Your, your, ultimately, you'll put that, that cost we pass down to somebody. Everybody in this room. Yeah, everybody in this room. <laughs> but that is the cost of recycling. This basically shows you that actually more material will come out of the residual waste stream, which also has a cost. You're taking more tonnage out of what's disposed than what you are in terms of the material value. Um, so you're saving on your disposal costs. There, could, there is obviously an impact of material moving from one stream to another, but what you're showing is that material has a much higher value when it moves from that stream to the other. So ultimately you're creating a, a more conducive environment for the circular economy because you're automatically putting material back onto the market that has a, has a value. And when you collect material at the curbside, and I think we all recognise this now by what's happened with China, is you're collecting the amount of contamination. And you're, cut, you're, you're paying to collect that in the single stream. You're paying to process that trash through the materials recycling facility. And then you're paying for it to be disposed of. So you're effectively paying already for that material three times. If you get a bottle and you take it through to a deposit system, you're, that person's doing the work for you. The producer's paying for that system for you. And you're getting a good product at the end of it. Like, they effectively can feed back into the um, you know, um, recycle content, and you know, if you, there's reports from you know the PT and Recycling Association that show that plastic bottles end up as plastic bottles um, through a deposit system. Most other PT bottles end up as carpet. So that's that's not a circular process. That that bottle will never be made into another bottle. And what we want to try and do is keep that bottle being made into another bottle and allowing producers to use that and feed that into their into their processes, not going to an end of process that's not you know, open loop and ultimately subsidising, well, allowing the carbon manufacturers to say that they're using recycled content, <laughs> which really they should be managing their product at the end of its life. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Uh, Andy, then Michelle. 
I was just going to say, so should we move everything? Can we get rid of the curbside at this point? Go to deposits and everything? Well, I think that would definitely be moved to raw materials going to a deposit type system in, in the long term. To take everything out of it. Well, I mean, there's never going to be... They could be in the future. All I'm saying is that when when the demand for material goes up, producers want, could want that material. And so the likes of Amazon, foreseeably, I mean, okay, there's a system out there called Loop at the moment. I don't know if you've seen it, but effectively a number of organisations are signed onto an, organ, uh, uh, an organisation and they do hard investors signed up, Unilever signed up, effectively, they're reusable containers, they get done, they can order online from their Walmart, it's into trial stage at the moment, but it's been rolled out, and they get delivered their hard dust ice cream in a, in a reusable container, they order it online, they, at the, when they get their next delivery, it then goes back and it gets refilled um, when they've got the quantity. So these systems... there's a deposit if you don't return Yeah, there's effectively a deposit on that, so if you don't... You know, return it and then effectively that after a period of the year, I think, because the thing it kind of goes out of circulation. So these models are not not coming, They're, they are there. It's easier with a bottle than it is potentially with a you know, with other material. Um, but yeah, so you envision the future where like there'll be no curbside eventually, right? There should be no trash, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I don't think, I mean, uh, the pool we need to push for the future. We shouldn't just push for, you yeah. know. The and the report that we did in London yeah. for Ontario was like, these systems work together. Ultimately, what do we want to do? We want to, we want to make sure that what the package we put on the market, if we need to put that package in the market, is captured and is recycled. And what systems do we need that? What systems, not just system, should we be relying on to do that? So, no orphaned materials. <laughs> yeah, basically. So, my, oh, sorry. my question is, um, did you have access to local um, values, information on sale of material, revenue from sale of materials? So in your, your statistic about 40% increased value of bottle bill pet over Murph pet, was that based on just national data or was did you have actual access to sales from Vermont materials from Murph? Yeah, we used industry and provided data. Um, so, but it was like, yeah, so it, was, it might not be the one specific, but it was East Coast, based right? Because our data is really different here than, and, you know, other MERS report 25% of the material coming in is contamination, and we we're looking at 7 8%. Yeah, and we didn't look at the contamination so, at all, yeah. Yeah, but, but it affects the quality and yeah. quality going out and marketing. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I just want to clarify that. We were meeting the ISRI standard for contamination rates, sending our bales to China. Our bales are clean. That, yeah, it's the other part of the country that wasn't meeting that. They were sending 20% contaminated bales over to China, and that's what happened to the recycling system. Yeah. It had nothing to do with bottle bill or. No, but ultimately, we're programs. still saying that, you know, in, in terms of this, we're saying that there's still material that's not being captured for the systems we've got. Unfortunately, not, you know, not one system can provide the ultimate solution, and that's being disposed of, and there is a cost to that. Um, and you know, and th that can't be forgotten. <coughs> that is a real cost that is being incurred that we don't need to incur if we have an expanded bottle bill that potentially captures like eighty five percent or could, because I'm worried, capture ninety percent of that material. And we haven't even calculated in here the environmental benefits of the litter abatement associated with plastic bottles in our environment. And we don't even know the cost, the environmental cost of that material in our environment in the long term. And these are the things we're just beginning to understand, and the public is also beginning to understand. Otherwise, why would but, you know the industry start making these commitments about minimum recycled content, or you know commitments to funding organisations like the Recycling Partnership so that they can discharge some, some of their obligations in terms of you know their, they recognise they have a responsibility for the products that they place on the market. We all do, as a consumer, we do. You know, and, and they do as a producer as well. At the moment, the public is picking up that cost. We're picking up that cost, and that's not particularly fair. Okay, let's press on. We're asking you lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's good that we are. Yeah. yeah. yeah so, um, yeah, the next chart sort of just lays everything out in terms of comparison of the numbers we looked at, in addition to sort of the unredeemed deposits, um, which Representative McCullough mentioned. And so, yeah, it's just an overview if you have any questions about the particular numbers here. Uh, 
but um, basically there are overarching benefits to extending the bottle bill, to implementing EDR. Um, to extend the bottle bill, you know, like we talked about, you get a better quality product. You know, despite the low levels of contamination, just in general, it's known that bottle bill, you know, the glass is not crushed at, on site. It can be passed on and made into new products. You get a better quality product that that buyers want, and that can be then put into the dri drive the demand for recycled content when these producers are making these goals, and you know they're talking about the chicken and the egg of where are we going to get the supply of this recycled content material. They get it from bottle bill states. That's what drives recycled content inputs now and will continue to do so for the future. So there has to be the supply to meet that demand. Um, otherwise, they're not going to be able to meet these voluntary commitments and, um, you know, or required commitments if legislation moves in that direction. Um, and then also, of course, you get additional tonnages after recycled if you increase the redemption rate. There is less contamination fewer GHG emissions, and this also relates to recycled content replacing using virgin material with using recycled content is a huge boon for, for carbon emissions. You know, not actually taking additional petroleum out of the ground to create plastic and using what we already have instead of then putting what we have into the landfill or, you know, spending all this time treating and shredding and everything but using a high quality material to make another high quality material keeping it within this circular system is the goal and so there should be policy that pushes for that um can i ask yeah. you just a quick question sure. on that yes. so i don't know the the energetics of the you know extraction of new material and turning it into a bottle versus taking a high quality used bottle and then making another bottle from it can you say something about emissions and energy use for, for, to do the, the virgin route versus the, the reusing, recycling route? Um, I haven't got any data now, but I mean, when we, we haven't got, we've got a chart actually that shows you where the GHD emissions, you know, emanate from. And everything we do at the back end really isn't having that much impact impact if on a bigger scale. So diverting something from landfill is kind of effective, like the tip of the iceberg. What we want to do and what you know refillables does is stop that material coming out, you know, being you know produced, you know, virgin material produced. And that is where all the energy use is. Um, and we can we can provide separately some of that data. Um, and I think just on that reuse element I suppose is Actually, the system in Norway is quite an interesting system. Um, their program only covers PET bottles and glass bottles and aluminium cans. But um, they they have a reusable system for glass, and that was uh, environmentally, you know, they did a life cycle analysis for it, and that was the best option for that. They looked at it for plastic bottles, and it didn't it didn't actually make sense to have a reusable system. So they actually phased out their reusable system for plastic bottles. Uh, so that's quite interesting. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's different for different material types, I suppose is what I'm saying. But in Oregon, for instance, now they've got that volume, they've actually start, implemented a new um, reusable system for beer bottles now. So they've kind of gone from a, a recycling rate that was dipped below 70% in the early 70s. They increased the scope, they increased the deposit, that got them up to 90%. And now they've introduced their own reusable for their craft beer industry to use a reusable bottle. So they're naturally through kind of the growth of the program encourage their members to take that step further and not just look at the site <coughs> and the reuse as well to gradually moving the discussion up the hierarchy. Thank you. Yep. And um, finally like we talked about basically just having a system that treats all beverage material equally, treats producers equally and makes it consistent for consumers. So basically, what we are advocating is for both um, and or EPR um, as well as modernization of the bottle bill. So like we said, you know, you already have some form of EPR through bottle bill um, where producers are paying for the collection and treatment of the recycling essentially. And then we're also saying that even with an EPR system, deposits are still relevant and effective in Europe, where they have recently implemented the Single-Use Plastics Directive, 
they're finding that to reach the 90% targets of plastic of plastic bottles being collected, um, which is now standard across all the member states, that there are countries that are now looking to implement deposit systems because producers have found that that's the only way for them to get those actual collection rates of the bottles. So there is definitely a place for both systems, and it can be definitely complementary. And um, yeah, packaging EPR on its own does not address litter and plastic pollution, so you have to think about actually the redemption rates you're getting, so that's another sort of piece for the bottle bill there. And then a bottle bill under full EPR provides a system that allows the government to set targets, so allows you to ask for the outputs that you want to see and let the system sort of in the market decide how best to get you there, and allows producers then to sort of have control to design a flexible system that would allow them to get the recycled content inputs that they need to meet those targets at the lowest cost, and provides consumers with convenience and a less confusing system, makes everything more standard, allows them to sort of take more control of their recycling and have a feel good sort of effort um, with contributing. And then also municipalities have landfill savings with that material that moves from the garbage. That's not going, you know, not getting recycled at all currently through the deposit system. Um, and can incur savings there. So overall we see that there's a place for, you know, multiple interventions that can increase recycling and environmental efforts in Vermont and that Vermont can you know, continue to be an environmental leader and provide an example for states around and the country as well. I think be bold because, you know, industry is also looking at how they can do this as well. So I don't think, you know, we all said, oh, I'm not going to recycle because my neighbour doesn't recycle. We all shouldn't say, I shouldn't do this because, you know, my neighbour isn't doing this. I think there's going to be, there is a momentum already in Maine looking at a bill, California looking at a bill. Um, I think the momentum is there, and you should look to see how you can do something that's going to be nice, business friendly. I mean, ultimately, as us as a company, we would we would encourage business, you know, um, um, producers to come to to the people like you and say, this is a bill we want, and this is a progressive bill. What we would like you to do is set the targets, enforce the targets, and then leave us to go and do what we need to do. But the producers aren't quite there yet. I think they will get there because ultimately they won't want this patchwork of bills that we heard about before. In order to stop the patchwork of bills, they should be coming forward with progressive bills that they, you know, with recommendations for what they would like. Are, are there examples of the extended producer responsibility on actually being responsible, the, the stewards? steward companies that are set up in the EPR. Are, are there examples of those companies and the EPR um, concept responsible for the, the deposit and collection part? Or are we keeping, are, are other jurisdictions keeping those separate? We, we do understand that, that the, uh, the, the, the deposit collection and, and then the collection of the containers and all of that shuffling around involves a number of different businesses yeah. and, and, and a lot of different people. Um, is, has that been folded into the EPR stewardship where they take that off of, they take that deposit return package off of, off of the, the uh, merchants? if you will, and, and handle it that way in EPR. Um, Alberta hasn't, hasn't got a full EPR system, it just has an EPR type system for the beverage containers. Um, and then effectively the stewards appoint um, agencies to work on their behalf, so they would appoint a collection agent or they, yep. you know, but they still have a network of redemption centers that work independently, so there's still that market. Um, driven approach, I suppose. I don't know if that's answered your question or not. Well, yeah, actually, I think I think you answered it. That that they're still separate. They haven't been combined. 
the, the, the deposit return and the sorting and the trucking of those things around still remain. And then the EPR for containers is a separate thing. They haven't been, been married. Well, I think they effectively what those programs do is appoint an agent to do the work most cost effectively for them. I mean, ultimately, they just want to capture the material. Yeah, I understood that for, but where we have, it looks like we're still using a dual system of, of EPR for, for containers, but also um, a deposit return system, which is separate from, from the one set up by the producers. Um, I, well, British Columbia is, is the same producers that come under both programs. They've chosen, they've chosen <coughs> to collect beverage containers through a deposit system because they think that's the most effective okay. mechanism. They've chosen to collect other packaging material through a curbside system because they, choose, they think that's the most effective system for okay. that packaging. Okay. So but it's still managed by the same producers. Yes. Yeah, so that, okay, thank you. Um, I have a question to sort of ask Kathy while you're here. It, it was the fraud question that came up this morning. Uh, this morning. That feels like a lot of Yesterday. And, you know, the, Mr. Bow was saying uh, there are already more glass containers redeemed through the redemption system than are sold by Vermont registered deposit initiators in the Vermont commingling system. So I was trying to square that with what we've been hearing all day because that sounds like our recycling rate would be 100% if you, or 101% or something. So I don't know, I'm trying to square that concern. I'm not doubting the legitimacy of a fraud concern, but um, do you know how to solve that math problem built in? I think there's a couple of things going on there. He did say commingling system. So the national, the big national brands are collaborating and commingling. So their containers when they're redeemed can be put together. Mm -hmm. We do have a lot of brands that are not participating in commingling that are in, some are in glass. Um, so if at the Redemption Center, those non-commingled containers go into the commingled container, then that's um, causing the manufacturers of the commingled products to pay for that, that container that shouldn't be in there. Okay. And if you do that enough times, you could have more than 100% of the glass that those, those brands, the commingled brands, sold. That coupled with, no matter what system you have, when you put a bounty or deposit on it, there, there will be fraud. And we, we respond to every complaint we get, but it can't be everywhere. And, and some of it might be accidental. Maybe people do occasionally get, pick things up in New Hampshire, but they also buy in Vermont and they just put it all together. As opposed to the deliberate pictures that you know, he showed us. And, and I think there's some of both going. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, technology and enforcement. I mean, in Oregon, they've have got, you know, Washington that doesn't have a deposit, and they've, they've got 10 cent deposit, and they've got California that's only got a 5 cent deposit. So they have eight people, employ eight people, just monitoring fraud in the system, um, going to those redemption centers that are on those borders, monitoring throughput, um, following up on complaints and things like that to try and get on top of it. And, you know, when we, it's very difficult to get data on any of, you know, to right. get good data, but when we've done work on it overseas, and there's mechanisms you can do to try and prevent that, you know, state-specific barcoding, but, you know, maybe a bit too much, I mean, things like that. But we think that the fraud rate is around four, three or four percent um, in, in most systems. The higher the recycling rate, the more likely, or the return rate, the more likely you are to start seeing these elements of fraud as well, <laughs> because it's only so yeah, high you can go, and then you, know, then you can start really pointing where that fraud might be coming from, because there's other types of fraud as well. Producers putting units on the market that aren't um, being sold, you know, being sold that aren't covered, so. Um, it's, I'm just forget. is New York 10 cents? No. Any cool? Right. So ten would would ten make us? Uh, is there any other ten cent deposit uh, joining us in adjacent jurisdiction? Just curious. Mm -hmm. That's cool. 
I don't know what Massachusetts is from. No, it's the only tens of U.S. are um, Michigan and Oregon, but Quebec, I think, is is either ten or fifteen. Um, yeah. And they've actually Quebec actually invested money um, into kind of technology based approach. <coughs> and they um, provided grants for. Um, and electronic sorting equipment for some of their centres and RVM machines at some of the retailers to try and um, get better governance in the system to try and look at fraud as well. So they actually gave grants for that technology improvement. And I think you know those technology providers can provide that machinery on a volume basis, so per unit um, processed as well as on a capital investment, so you can do it either way. Um, and I think one of our first presentations also, it was the BC um, experience where they were talking about I think 90% of their class was going into making new bottles. So I, my impression was that people are not making new bottles in New England, or there was a facility in Massachusetts yeah. that closed, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, is that kind of, um, especially for something that heavy and relatively low value, is this sort of a, uh, a hit or miss thing in terms of what your physical marketplace is like in terms of the opportunities to handle those materials? Yeah, I mean, I think the guys here will, yeah, it's harder. You don't want to transport glass very far at all because it's very heavy and very expensive. So, um, yeah, but I mean, that potentially comes into where you might look for more reuse in some of those bottles and having using your local craft beer network. Um, to optimize their glass, that glass use locally. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I mean, these guys are probably better versed on markets for glass. Right. And my last question, I promise for now, is I, this is really to my Murph colleagues. So I had thought that um, glass was a bit of a bane of your existence, like that it ended up breaking, contaminating, and grinding up parts and shortening your lifespans. So that it was something that you and it sounded like to me it would be a positive to have glass out of the MRFs. Is that an a Well, we're still going to have glass at the MRF. You know, right. have to expand the model. Right, there's going to be pasta oh. jars already. Yeah, yeah. Right. So that still has to be managed. And at the, at, when you, once you install the equipment and you have the labor, the cost is the same. It still costs the same to process it. It's just the fact that there's no markets locally for glass. Okay. There is wear and tear. Um, on the system, but if you get it out right up front, yeah. which we do, both Mercs do, because it's smart to do, then you don't have as much of that. But the, I would ask the question about transportation, right? So mm -hmm. when there aren't markets, it, does it make sense to ship something 100 miles away because it might have an incrementally better chance to become right. another bottle than having it beneficially be used locally? It, you know, these are global and life cycle yeah. impact questions that need to be constantly changing. There's a exactly. lot of constantly changing. You could do an assessment right. now and two weeks later it will be, you know, so you have, yeah. But of course we had the bottle bill for 45 years. <laughs> or EPR for all glass. Right. Yeah. Which is yeah. what yeah. I like. I like <laughs> what <too. laughs> I think the problem with that is that you're, you know, there's, you have, it needs to be done on like the like product. So I mean, potentially, if you're going to do it on a plastic mayonnaise jar, you should or a glass mayonnaise jar. You should do it on a plastic mayonnaise jar because you're creating a differential between a product. And that, I mean, that's why we say you should have a deposit on all beverage containers because that's fair. You start putting a deposit on a, as I said, a glass mayonnaise jar, and you could have it on a plastic mayonnaise jar as well. Um, because there's no effectively difference. It's just that you don't want to have the glass. Yeah, that plastic, the mayonnaise jar has a good, has a, a higher value if you collect it from the water system. Maybe some people think it's wise to pay more for soda than it is for water. Maybe <laughs> not wise, but they're willing to. Healthy. Well, I mean, oh, healthier choice. So, yeah. Kathy, you've been waiting patiently. Slightly different topic, but um, <laughs> so in the United States, our bottle bills came. Um, they target the type of beverages yeah. rather than the type of container. Um, and so are you aware of either Canadian or European bottle bills where they're considering moving toward looking or managing container type rather than beverage type? And because we're doing a lot of discussion about glass in Vermont as far as you know, what should we be doing with that? Um, well, I mean, almost all of the 
the community programs now have moved to just about all beverage types, so that has come. Do they have, it hasn't looked at, yeah. they're not, they're most have covered the beverage sector, I suppose, not necessarily material, I think, yeah. I think it's starting to be looked at, though. We've been in conversations recently where they're talking about food containers as well. Yeah, and what, yeah, why can't food containers yeah. also be included? And even if you just kept it, you know, even if a program just kept it under beverages, are they thinking about, because there's always going to be new beverages. On yeah, there, right? yeah. Oh, because I mean, the Alberta system just says any beverage. It's any beverage. So uh, they collect Tetra Pak, they collect pouches. They haven't got a market for that material, but their members have to pick up the cost for that material, whether it goes to energy recovery or wherever it might, else it might be. But it covers every beverage in whatever container. It covers a bag in a box. It covers, you know, some of, some of those materials are very difficult to handle at those redemption centres. Yeah, but they, even those kind like of. Like box wine. Box wine. Box of eggs. Right, it's over the box. Those things are really difficult. Like. And that's under the bottle bill. Yeah. It's the that's they a lot are the it, It's a very ma it doesn't. <laughs> it's very magic intensive, you know, yeah. it's difficult for them. Um, but they don't have as many sorts as like that they have here. It's probably all commingle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just no need to but, but yeah. Yeah, but the conversations are expanding and we sort of advocate more flexible legislation that doesn't, you know, name everything so that as the market emerges, the legislation can expand to include things rather than you have to go in and change the legislation every time there's new products that come on the, on the market. Yeah, other programs like the door deposits and things like aerosol cans people are looking at because they're kind of similar. People don't want them in the merch necessarily aerosol can, so can you have a deposit on an aerosol can? And that, you know, if you have technology as well, it's very similar to managing an aerosol can as it is to manage the same shape. It's, you know, <laughs> it can be scanned easily, so that's another area. Um, kind of on that point, uh, so I think everybody found the Ontario study really interesting. Do you have this whole idea of the kind of broader language that gives flexibility. Do you have other studies or examples of language you could share of kind of what's been working elsewhere in terms of you know effectively setting those kinds of targets that and giving that flexibility to the producers to, to deal with it? Yeah. I'd love to see any <coughs> examples of um, how that's working elsewhere, analyses or language would be yeah. um, and I just wanted to circle back just briefly the Health impacts. So, is that um, you know we had a let's see, I'll just hit this way. A disturbing presentation last week from Dr. Last week, two weeks ago, Dr. Myers uh, <coughs> talking about endocrine disruptors. So, we uh, I would say Vermont was on the more health protective side of things for setting PFAS levels at 20 parts per trillion rather than the federal 80. Um, but in terms of now there's data coming out that as an endocrine disruptor, uh, the, the highest safe level might be in, more in line with one-tenth of one part per trillion. So uh, far smaller. And, um, and I just don't know if that kind of science is uh, making its way into the assessments that are saying <coughs> what kind of plastics do we uh, prefer to see in the environment and what kinds would we prefer not to see in the environment because of their health impacts when either through it could be I don't know, food contact or it could be as litter or it could be there in the ocean or they even end up with uh, aerosols and stuff like that. We, I mean that's not really our area of expertise I would say the health impacts of some of this. I mean we do work around microplastics and some of the impacts of emerging, you know, views around microplastics, but we haven't, <coughs> we haven't looked specifically at kind of the PFAS areas. I thought that, yeah, so we can't really comment. Sure. On that. Okay. Well, Kathy will figure that out by our next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we are uh, four minutes to a journey. So everyone's been. Uh, uh, thank you very much for coming. Any further questions before we? 
wrap up as a committee. Okay, thank you. Again. Thank you. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for looks like we were listening hard today to a lot of uh, data. Um, I would we didn't have a chance to loop back and look at people's submissions, so I'll make sure that you know I think. Probably one way to help us move along between before next meeting is send out that packet just to make sure everyone has this, the most current packet because I think a few submissions came in uh, in the last few days. And then uh, I'm going to try to set up some sort of table for, you know, start to see what the pattern is in terms of what we are saying and then we'll send something around to help have people rank choices, start to sort of maybe a doodle poll on of all the things on the list, you know, start to see where um, there's some center of gravity amongst the group for taking action. Um, not that we have to come up with a consensus-based recommendation, but just it would be helpful to someone reading this report if, to know that seven people were interested in moving this piece forward and only one on some other piece or something. So just to clarify, so are we voting on options? Or? No, I just thought it might be helpful that, you know, informally, just to start to have a sense of what is drawn, what are people feeling like this is the area where you believe is the most promising for doing additional work. Not us just to come up with uh, uh, a plan, to, but that uh, in terms of bringing forward kind of a summary to the legislature and say, we've been through this uh, journey together. We've looked at a lot of different things, and here are the areas where we think might most productively be looked at further by the legislature. I'm wondering if, um, I mean, given we've you know, gotten a ton of information, to me, I mean, could the lens be, if you're setting up a kind of matrix or something, like how different policies are actually moving us towards the rules set out in the statute, like which ones are, do people, you know, feel like are, are the key pieces of moving it? I mean, I'm just like, if right. we all vote for different things, I don't know how informative that is. Yeah, yeah. Um, we all vote for our own, and I don't know where we go, <laughs> but more like, you know, how are we looking at how do these fit together? I mean, there's a clumping of, of I mean, there were a lot of like really ideas in common and stuff, so. Well, um, I just said this sort of thinking aloud with you, so we can we can tune the concept up. I think that's a good improvement to say how do these ideas start to check the boxes that are in our original charge, for instance. One thing that might be helpful too, and there's obviously trade-offs with any of the potential options that we go down, you know, the term of benefits and cons, or how it will impact systems differently. It's probably important that we know the potential benefits of going down a certain approach and yeah, the potential consequences. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think our goal is always fair and balanced, so let's make sure that we pass along uh, the full story as we know it, as opposed to um, some preconceived outcome or something like that. Yeah. Anything else? I just want to get clear. We, so um, we've had our two up. Uh, over meetings, then we have a, one meeting in November? Yeah, but I think it's the second Tuesday. Yeah, and 12th. 12th, yeah. yeah. And so then, it would be great if we could have, um, and I know we wanted to ask these folks lots of questions today, and so we kind of did it to ourselves. We kind of ate up our discussion time. But it would be really good if uh, at the November meeting, if we could have some committee discussion time. Yeah, I mean, I think actually, you know, I had thought we would have an hour of it I know, today, I know. Um, and it seemed to, uh, actually, given that we had witnesses who traveled and you know, yeah. a chance to do a deeper dive on a, a number of things to stick with the opportunity we had, but I agree. So there was one witness who, um, because of illness, needed to reschedule, but I think next uh, next time we're we're going to shift modes really to being thinking about basically report writing starting to draw things into a conclusion and have that kind of discussion. Just like we started to do with like, well, how about glass at the MRFs and this and that. And we and I think the pro and con thing is a, a good idea, a nice format yeah. to let people see oh, what the opportunities and costs are. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So the, the report is due December 1st? Yes, but we don't have our sixth scheduled meeting till December 3rd. December 3rd. Right? 3rd. Yeah. So um, you'll have to take it up with the committee chair. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to work. No, We're all so, going to jail. Yeah. The sergeant at arms will be gathering the two of us and letting us in the cellar for three days. Um, no, I think we, because of the holidays, it just seemed like the first was it's well ahead of the session. I mean, that's the important thing. And so rather than uh, disrupt people's lives around the holidays, just honor the holidays, uh, get by them, and you know, uh, turning in our report uh, a, week, a week after will still be very timely. Okay. And well before uh, the end of December, which is another bad time to have any kind of deadline you know, for, for our meetings. Great. Of course, me. All right, thank you, everybody.